<laughs> Excellent. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing Live Show number 225. With me is special co-host, uh, Ms. Katya Mohammed, or affectionately known as Kat, uh, who is the Director of Education for Ahoa, although that's not why she's necessarily here today. It is really where we want her expertise and her opinion on lots of cool things. Also with us is Mr. Robert Cole with Rock Cheetah and the elusive, the mysterious, the what is it? The snow leopard of the industry. <laughs> the the enigma wrapped in a mystery. A mystery. Holly Miss Holly's over with influencer sales. Holly meet Cat. Cat meet Holly. How are you? Hi, Cat. It's great <laughs> to meet you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. very clearly. All good. All good. All good. Fantastic. I saw your promo and I had to be here. Oh, good. It sounds fascinating. It. <laughs> well, good. Holly normally people. doesn't show up for our regular shows, so <laughs> that, that's. <laughs> I teach a class on Fridays, and so it's a challenge to get here, but I gave them the day off today. So here I am. No place I'd rather be. Actually, Kat, just so you know, that Holly does an amazing sales training program called Influencer Sales, and that is literally the reason why she has a a conflict with it because she's so successful at it. She's had to add multiple classes per week. She does them online, and one one of the opportunity windows, unfortunately, clashes with our live show. But she had given everybody, what's the day, Holly? What, what, did, what did you give them off? Uh, the holiday? Oh, the holly day. The holly day. <laughs> <laughs> and I and Holly, more, uh, oh, go ahead. It's back from my old days when I had to say, Hop, happy holidays from the Holiday Inn, Arlington at Boston. This is Holly. How may I help you? <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of holly. Have a holly. A lot of holly. Okay, anyway, right. anyway. Back, back, meanwhile, meanwhile, back at Cat. Cat, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to take notes. I'm going to keep an eye on, on any chats that may pop up with this. And per, mm-hmm. as, as Holly mentioned, we had a precursor conversation, a little bit of a lead in with LinkedIn Live to give us a chance to go over and, and dialogue about what we're going to be talking a little bit about today. And I leave it to you to, to lead the conversation as to what you would like to start with first. And since I have a much more intelligent group with me now than just you being stuck with me, then we'll probably have some pretty cool questions. So I leave it to you, Kat. What would you, what would you, would you like to dig into first? Um, you know, it sounded like uh, the human trafficking topic was one that was in demand that you wanted to hear a little bit more about. And actually, I'd love to hear, um, Holly, from your insights as well, if uh, you participated in or heard any buzz when you were in the hotel um, regarding human trafficking and training for staff, um, the sales staff, and really – the folks outside of the owner are usually the ones in and about the hotel that can notice um, different things going on and patterns. So um, I would love to hear from your insights what else is going on. We we go out and do training, but I'm not sure what gets disseminated um, or if there was buzz even before um, we we got involved as far as the HOA. You know, it's really interesting. Uh, I'm very. I live in Arizona. I'm very involved with the Arizona um, HSMAI chapter here. And we had a uh, someone come in and speak to the group about uh, sex trafficking, and I think it was probably one of the largest turnouts that we've had. And people were incredibly engaged. They really they wanted more, and so and it was a cro- I was I was surprised. It really brought operation sales marketing. Uh, it it was it's a critical um, topic today. I would say, which astounded me. I had no honestly, I had no idea prior to this. Hmm, interesting. Really? No, it's 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 been a topic for a number of years. Um, boy, the <clears throat> I'm trying to think in the late probably 2008 2007, um, Dominican Republic was all over the topic because they were they were having some severe, you know, some severe problems with it. Had a campaign, and I I think it's fantastic that both Ahoa and uh, HLA are now all of well, and your former boss Chip. Chip Rogers at now at, at AH in LA, um, he got up at the Dallas um, oh, hotel conference and basically said at least um, AH in LA's position is that every ho- every hotel should have mandatory training across the industry. And again, I've been sometimes critical of AH in LA um, because you know, in many times they'll kind of you know, side on, well, how do we save expenses for the hoteliers and things like that? And here they are going 100% all in. So kudos to uh, Chip. And I think the insights that he got uh, leading AHOA that probably informed those decisions to probably push on some folks at HNLA who were possibly resistant to that sort of initiative. So great stuff. 
Absolutely. I'd say most times anything that's uh, across the board regulation, um, uh, AHOA as, long, as well as AHMA hasn't always been on board with that. But of course, um, anything to help save uh, the hoteliers money. Um, oddly enough, with human trafficking, the approach that we took that has really allowed it to be more impactful is instead of saying it's a, a moral responsibility to act, it's also a smart business decision absolutely um, because of how much damage comes to your reputation and in addition to that some hoteliers along with gms are getting fined um, and held uh, legally liable um, if they are aware that things are happening and do not address it and in addition yeah. some of the the flags are dropping the owners if they have it taking place because it you know it spreads a, right. a bad reputation across the board so the risks are pretty huge, um, and once that's uh, put in front of hoteliers in particular, and many of them start this business as a legacy to pass on, um, and you know, just overlooking certain things could end up destroying not only your life but uh, generations ahead of you. Yeah. yeah, and it's the right. It is the right thing to do for the industry to to stand up and do this and it's something that is i i wouldn't say necessarily solvable because it's a very very difficult problem but at least if you can prevent it and kind of say not in our you know not in our place sort of thing and put up those um, various things um i headed marketing again this was you know long time ago, you know, late, late 80s for an economy lodging group. And we instituted policies of requiring IDs, right, on check and then a huge pushback. Oh, it's going to, it's like, no, you know, we can go back to the earliest days of inkeeping. There's, there's precedent for law to say, no, we need to know who you are. And boy, yes, sex trafficking, you know, drugs, all that sort of, it was curtailed because they went other places because they weren't being scrutinized. They didn't have to go produce a produce a valid ID to check in. And they said, "Well, we'll never stay here again." It's kind of like, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a win-win. So, what oh. what are you doing? I don't. I heard a little bit, obviously, on the promo piece, but I don't really know what Aho is doing uh, from an education standpoint. Can you elaborate? Certainly. So, um, as of right now. Um, Oh, and for all those listening, that's the Asian American Hotel Owners Association, and we work with hotel owners across the U.S. Um, there are two certified trainers on staff, myself and uh, one of my coworkers, Brandon Jackson. And uh, in addition to us, we have uh, partnered with uh, BEST, that's Businesses Ending Slavery and Trafficking. Uh, we are certified in their training, but um, we also have another program with Polaris and um, uh Department of Homeland Security's uh, blue campaign, but I'll, I'll address that in a second. As far as the main in-person training through BEST, um, either Brandon or myself or one of the BEST um, staff travel out to different areas and host in-person training um, for hotel owners and their staffs that are members of AHOA. Um, and the, the training is considered um, meeting the requirements of certain state regulations or local regulations. It doesn't um, work across the board is not one blanketly accepted trading program, but um, it's certainly hitting the main points that a lot of states are regulating as a required training for hoteliers. Um, and in, a, in addition to our in-person training, those are really great to hit large numbers in one shot. So you can say, you know, have all of your staff come or all your head housekeepers um, and we'll train them in one shot at uh, town halls. Um, recently, or this year actually, AHOA started doing um, these kind of town hall tours where um, we travel it over a course of three days to three different areas and do in-person training at each one. Um, and in addition to that, through BEST, there's an online platform where you can complete the training completely online. It's about 30 minutes. It's pretty interactive, um, and that's for you or your hotel staff. Um, and at the end of it, you get a certificate. And same thing, the Polaris one that we partnered with them in a Department of Homeland Security, that one's a video that you watch, and we're in the midst of revamping it. But um, with that one as well, at the conclusion of it, you, you are not able to fast forward through it or anything right now. Um, so you have to sit through the whole thing, <laughs> all 37 minutes. And um, you uh, earn a certificate as well that um, you can hang in your hotel or, um, you know, keep for when, when any visits come, or it's even helpful, I've heard, for the financial world when you have to uh, apply for a loan or so on, it shows that you're taking active steps to protect your business. Oh, we lost that was a lot. <laughs> Sorry. 
You have to be an AHOA Association member? Um, yes, in order to receive the training at no cost, uh, it is a, a benefit of AHOA membership, but once you are a member, there's no additional fee for it. Fantastic. Double, so, yeah. double thumbs up. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so I'll tell you, we are in the midst of, uh, uh, um, January is actually Human Trafficking Awareness Month. Um, so we are in the midst of developing uh, some really interesting and really cool ideas for um, that entire month to actively continue training and um, prevention awareness uh, that whole month. And some of it includes uh, an in-person, I'm sorry, a, a panel, like a webinar with a, a panel of different uh, individuals that either work on the training side or a survivor um, or would possibly a hotelier that has a noticed, uh, saw something and said something um, and helped somebody. But uh, we're putting together a panel. We're doing some in-person training. We're looking at broadcasting some trainings each week. Um, there's a lot of ideas that we want to get out there. But uh, ultimately, the goal is to just raise awareness. Um, uh, with some of the programs that we're hosting in person, in order to get your certificate, you actually have to complete a questionnaire. Um, and there's there's always uh, folks in the audience that don't complete the questionnaire for whatever um, their reasons may be. But at the end of the day, they're still exposed to the information. Um, and once you, you hear it, this is the type of content that once you hear it and see it, you can't get it out of your head. So uh, <laughs> it sticks around, thankfully. Well, that's, um, even, uh, I was going to ask if you would go over any of the highlights that you cover, because I, I was fascinated by the content that I've seen so far. Certainly. Uh, I would say the, the one that I wanted to address the most, just because I, I'm not sure how many people would tune in today or to the um, post recording that gets uh, sent out. or posted. Thousands, but, hundreds of thousands. Oh, excellent. <laughs> um, honestly, the, the only thing or the number one thing I wanted to discuss are the most common signs of uh, human trafficking. And now uh, I keep saying human trafficking and this, these specifically, these signs are more applicable to sex trafficking. The, uh, the federal definition uh, of human trafficking includes sex trafficking as well as labor trafficking. Um, and some of the signs of sex trafficking are the same with labor, but um, there's just some small nuances, of course. Uh, the commercial sex acts are typically not there um, or as prevalent. But um, the most common signs of uh, human trafficking, if you are uh, sex trafficking, if you're in the hotel, is uh, evidence of violence, abuse, or coercion um, with one of the parties involved, uh, evidence of an unusual amount of control over an individual. Um, you'll see a young person that seems to be dressing and acting like an adult. Uh, in those is instances, there's usually somebody kind of lingering around them. Uh, if they check in on their own or check in with the other person, they, they're taught how to act and taught how to present themselves. So you'll find that they're very careful with their wording um, and how they posture themselves, the distance they keep from the other individual. Um, you'll find uh, more on the housekeeping side when upon entering the room that there seems to be an unusual number of cell phones, used towels, um, hotel keys for the room, um, except the number of condoms in the room that are used. Uh, and then Another one for a hotel staff to notice is if there's a, a frequent amount of visitation to singular, a single room um, in the hotel. So there's just a lot of traffic. Now, um, all of these, uh, they're, they're kind of behavior-based um, actions that you see. And it's very difficult to tread the line of not being discriminatory when trying to view these things. So it's recommended if you do see any of these signs and it makes you, you know, say, hmm, something about this doesn't feel right, uh, just make sure to document everything for everybody and anybody and keep it equal across the board and set up a plan of action within your hotel where um, whatever process that you do, it's cookie cutter for all of them. There's a standard operating procedure when it comes to seeing something. And uh, if you're ever you know, really concerned, you might hear somebody getting beaten or you see something that really makes you want to take action immediately. Um, if you don't want to call 911, you can call the human trafficking hotline um, and uh, um, they can set you up with somebody that's locally in the human trafficking task force that can come to your hotel and check it out or your place of business, honestly. The, the hotline um, filters through Polaris, so um, it'll have a national uh, outreach ability. Um, and we have a lot of great 
uh, resources to let them know who locally can help you. Uh, some of the human trafficking task forces that function through the law enforcement agencies, they'll even set up sting operations where they can come into your hotel. Hoteliers uh, generally do not want that type of attention to come to them. Um, it, it's a lot to have, you know, several squad cars show up and then come through the hotel. Um, it draws too much negative attention. Um, so if you get involved with your local law enforcement, you have the opportunity to have them come and, and actually plan out what it would look like if they have to call about a potential tip off um, for somebody in the hotel to save. So I would say those are the main ones. And there's no there's no uh, exact fix that would work for all hotels. Um, they all function differently. I um, mean, you know, as you were mentioning before with uh, the the checking in situation, I know on my uh, promo with Lauren, I had uh, spoken about the fact that you know, you're, you're dealing with these advanced hotels where there is less people in action. Um, so you're, we're going to find little holes in what works for some and what just can't work for other hotels. Um, but one of the, the strategies that seems to work best, most um, as recommended by best that uh, business, business is ending slavery and trafficking, is to just have a very long-term strategy and develop great relationships with your local government officials, as well as local law enforcement agencies. So those are the main points. On yeah, also, it's a lot. I just wanted to, yeah, yeah, no, it's also, it really is a lot to take in. Um, the, the other part I just wanted to throw in there is with those uh, most common signs, uh, don't just look at, you know, young ladies, look at everybody coming in, um, boys, girls, those, you know, non uh, gender conforming, whoever, is walking in, you know, give them the same equal <laughs> scan that you would anybody else. It's is there you mentioned a, that earlier in our, thing, uh, our earlier presentation that, that, that unfortunately one of the more abused aspects of our culture is the the, uh, the non-specific transgenders and so forth, the people that are on the, the fringes of our social acceptance kind of thing where they're growing, but they're still, they're being, they're being exploited in a lot of ways. And you're saying that that, that was one of the lead in of, of people first signs of that you draw into and stuff like that. So uh, excellent point that you made. And Lauren, very quickly, um, Lily is trying to get in. She Yes, I sent her Tim's one. link since Tim didn't oh, pop did. in. I okay. sent her Tim's okay. links today. If you see Tim Peter popping in, don't be surprised. It's not going to be Tim. And I'm actually reaching out to Steph and make sure that I'm not excluding her by. Steph active. is not. Steph is not going to be on. She's oh, okay. Out. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. And, and that's one thing we we saw Lauren taking lots of notes. Lauren, you mistook January. It was Human Trafficking Awareness Month, not Human Trafficking. Say- and you've got to stop those programs. Okay, that is not a seg- <laughs> that is not a segment shift initiative. I put awareness okay? in. I put awareness in. I oh, put awareness in. oh, he's, he's adjusted all those campaigns. Good, good. Well, you Always look at an angle to increase occupancy. No, yeah. no, Lauren. <laughs> I put awareness in. Did you open awareness month? Yes, I did. <laughs> when we first started this, uh, for a while because there's so so many words and you want to refer to it quickly we started saying just human trafficking training and when you type you're no. like wait a minute are we training on how to human traffic so we should we put awareness in there so. That's right. yeah. yeah yeah not getting if you maximize your business through drug cartels well here's a new way to score even more <laughs> right? no, no, I literally yeah, yeah. Sorry. Hello. I Hey, Lily. We're still Hi, on our, Lily. we're still, oh, I'm sorry, Lily, please meet uh, Katya, um, Kat. Uh, Lily is one of our, our regular co-hosts with us as well. She uh, is an expert in revenue management and uh, a lot of other stuff, just revenue management is her business. So, uh, but, Hang on, um, Lauren. Lauren, uh, we've reached a milestone. We have more women hosts men. on the program <laughs> than men. Yeah. 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 It's <laughs> just the beginning. Oh right. my God! It's going to be dominance from this point forward. This is scary. Uh, Holly is not. Uh, Holly has not picked up her end of the bargain on really <laughs> facilitating that over the last several. Uh, I know. It's several been months. Me. You realize so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> can you talk a little bit more about the labor side of it? I don't ever hear that. Huh. Yeah. So uh, very similarly with the labor, um, some of the signs that you see. Uh, is another force fraud coercion into doing what they're doing. You find that the individuals don't have control over their own personal identification um, pieces. Uh, uh, a lot of times there's somebody else that will show up 
um, or take calls on their behalf. But um, uh, labor trafficking uh, really boils down to somebody working and the, the money that they earn, uh, somebody is taking that. Um, or they might say, I'll take this money and offer you housing, but you need to work uh, X amount of hours and so on. Um, we uh, recommend, or through best when we touch on that in the training, uh, we recommend posting, uh, we give them some posters to put in the back of the house, in front of the house, um, to also be able to call in. There's actually a, um, a visa program if you are brought to the U.S. Um, under human trafficking, and, and forgive me for not knowing it off the top of my head, but um, there's actually a special visa for trafficked victims from the labor side or the sex trafficking side to be able to stay within the U.S. Because ultimately, the ones that are brought into the U.S. under human trafficking, they're doing it to better themselves or better their families back home. Um, so there's a greater purpose for them. They were brought in under, uh, you know, misinformation. But um, the the idea is to still help them uh, and help them progress and coming out of this is they say that the path into it is difficult but the path out is even harder i was going to um, say because they have to be afraid to report anything because they're going to be afraid that they've got to they're going to be sent back they're going to go to jail they're going to get get well, or their from, families, yeah. i mean a lot of the they're, folks yeah. they're working with are not good people i mean it's one of those things you know you're going to do this or we know where your family lives sort of thing and they get put in impossible impossible situations right and again they you know they're they're picking on the most vulnerable people who are saying hey we're trying to get to the u.s can you oh we can help you we have a perfect thing just give us this and sometimes they pay for, you know they, they've saved up a lot of money they've paid these people and then all of a sudden everything just goes south and they're stuck and you know they have no money they don't oh we'll hang on to your paperwork so it's safe and you won't get caught that's and all of a sudden you know the the train tracks are headed the wrong direction and there's no way to get off it's it's not good no and and even domestically they found like um our one of the things we mentioned is you might encounter a young lady young boy whomever well let's say an adult even, because human trafficking, the average age of entry is around 14, which means there's a lot younger and a lot older that uh, comes to that. But once they're 18 or over, you are treated as an adult. Um, so the rules are a little bit different. If you're under 18 and you're involved with trafficking, then it's uh, automatically uh, rape or, mis uh, or inappropriate conduct where you call the police, it'll be dealt with. But you might encounter somebody who's 18 or over and you see that there's obvious signs of trafficking. Um, and you might go to this person and say, hey, you know, can I call 911 and help you? And they'll say no. Or you'll call 911 and when they show up, they say, oh, no, I want to be here. I'm here, you know, uh, consensually. This is my boyfriend. I'm really happy. Um, and then you end up kind of looking foolish mm -hmm. and bringing unnecessary attention to your hotel. So it, it really is a, a difficult spot to, to be in, to want to help. And then the brainwashing that's done, it's brainwashing plus um, a, a lot of drug usage, um, these folks try their best to escape the life they're in, um, so they end up getting uh, highly addicted to different drugs. Well, it's, yep. it's another way to keep control over them, right? So, uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's, what? that's bad. What are the statistics like? Like, how bad is this? Oh, gosh, and once again, I wish I had more updated uh, stats for you right now. Can I say Sorry. I'll, back to <laughs> I'll share some really because I don't want to give uh, misinformation with uh, how much it has grown. And recently there's been so much more training involved that there's been a, a pretty good response from the hotel side in reducing um, folks and traffickers showing up there. So I, I do apologize for not having yeah, numbers, but I'll get back to you guys. So it was growing, but you feel like because of the training, it, we're starting to have an impact? Uh, I think we're starting to have an impact, and uh, traffickers and jobs uh, are going to different locations now. Um, that's the the most we get world from a HOA standpoint. We we target or work with hotel owners, so that's the main industry that we're able to really impact. Um, but it, it's we're from our side. We're hearing members more and more get involved, and in some of the trainings, um, I'm hearing from members directly when they were able to actually redirect. Uh, traffickers away from their hotel and uh, just stop it. If not save a life, they just stop them from coming into the hotel. So reduce potential. I'm just yeah, going to uh, Google stuff off to the side. Uh, yeah, 32 the, billion a year. 
Uh, oh, yeah. 54.5 million trafficked persons sexually exploited. $32 billion industry? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep. 4.5 million yeah, sexually 1.5 million victims in the U.S., 600 to 800,000 women, children, and men um, bought and sold across international borders every year. Yeah, so not. it's a big, big business and a, and a big, big yeah. issue, so. I want to say it's one of the, the top uh, black market industries is human trafficking before yeah. drugs and anything else. Before yeah. drugs? Just because the, the cost, there's no cost for a human typically when they're right. kidnapping them and uh, right. telling them, you know, come be a model in the U.S. Um, there's less cost up front. Yeah, and you don't have you don't have another cartel or other people trying to intercept your shipment or something like that and trying to. I, I actually you may have that happen with with human trafficking, but yeah, you, know, you have a large you know cocaine shipment or something like that. That's a lot you know a lot different. So yeah, it's it's a it's a horrible horrible. Um, what from, from the, I mean I don't know you call it business, but yeah, it's it's you know. It's it's Kat, from, the from, worst. From, from your perspective, some of the additional training that you went through, uh, you know, for the certification and so forth. But just you, you know, you've kind of put the pieces to a lot of different things together, so you have a broader perspective on on the different aspects to be considerate of. As you mentioned, you know, the the, the way people treat each other in your common spaces and whether or not their 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 uh, the room conditions and so forth. Is there any other telltale symbols or things from a from an ownership perspective that we can, you know, if we, if we were running a hotel, say, okay, team, we're going to get together, we may not be able to go through the certification right away or what have you, but here, let's be aware of these things. What are some things that you'd want to make sure hoteliers knew that they can immediately converse about with their teams and their team meetings saying, hey, you know, alley rally time, let's talk about this. Did you say alley rally? Alley rally. <laughs> Remember the alley rallies? No. I used to call them, no? I don't know what an alley rally is. Oh I think most hotel should be owners are alley in the alley. Most of these should be maybe in a meeting room as opposed to the alley no. behind the hotel. <laughs> I don't, I don't okay. Know. I used to call them netmas. Okay. For, for the record, I used to call them netmas, which was nobody ever told me anything. Uh, <laughs> me. Okay. And it happened 8 a.m. every morning, and there was a rep from every department that showed up in the, in the, in the exec office, and we talked about what was going on that day. Just – Hey, stand up meeting in the 21st century. We call that stand up meeting. Uh, thank you. Okay. okay. Well, but, <laughs> <laughs> alley rallies used to be, we used to do it in the restaurant alley rally because the alley is the front of the line. That's the alley. So uh, alley rallies, you, you, you get a ready alley rally. Let's get there. This is what's going on. These are the menu specials, blah, 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 banquet events, blah, blah, blah. So it's called alley rallies. All right. So I may have dated myself, Miss Stand Up, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, you just added yourself as an F and B guy. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. Oh, yeah, we are all right. something at our hearts. Yeah, <laughs> so Warren what, is what perhaps the only person ever to use that term. You have to recognize. Oh my gosh, no, I, very didn't quick know. I didn't. I didn't call it first. It was. I, it was, it I inherited it. it. I did. I inherited Popular it. In restaurants. Yeah, I did, yeah, I did start in restaurants and, and pretty much yeah, the yeah, alley rally. Um, so, so there was an important things? question in there. <laughs> yeah. What would be some of the things from a starting point? From a starting point, what if if you're going to have your next alley rally or stand up? What are some things that you can point out saying, "Hey, right off the bat, let's make sure we're aware of this." What What are some things we should be looking for right now that, without certification, without training, but just growing awareness? What are some things that we could probably tell hoteliers? Uh, I will tell you the the one thing that really stood out with uh, the additional training that I had done. It involved a lot more victims and survivors telling their stories and um, a lot if not all of them, had stated that uh, when they walk into a hotel, the staff would either turn around and snicker or talk about them, but show some sign of awareness, but not say anything to them. Even a simple, how are you doing? How is your day? Um, so having that people interaction. So um, a lot of these folks that are in the, the victim side of it have a, uh, have already this perception that everybody is looking at them and that they're a bad person. Um, so if you see somebody and you don't treat them with the same respect as you would anybody else, or even just kindness, hmm. just give them genuine kindness, um, they tend to close up and sometimes go deeper into that feeling of uh, not being a good person and that they deserve the spot they're in. So one hmm. of the things I would definitely ask is uh, for all those that interact, uh, just 
keep that same kindness uh, across the board. And if you see somebody that looks like they might be prostituted or getting trafficked, um, just be a little kinder. Maybe offer uh, them to, you know, use your hotel phone if they need to call the police or something like that. Um, so uh, as far as the alley rally, just like uh, genuine kindness goes a, a long way um, with folks that are involved in this life. So I have kind of a two-part question for you. Um, one is, you know, a lot of the like tips, training for alcohol awareness and things like that, they'll have sort of a one-sheet resource that you can print and have in your back office. Do you have something like that with some of the typical signs, like they may be paying in cash, they may not want to show their ID, you know, it may be an, an older man and a younger girl who seems uncomfortable, whatever those different things may be. Do you have sort of a one sheet that you can point hotels to that they could put up in their back offices? Absolutely. Um, so one through best on their website, they, they have some information that you can download and you could also purchase uh, cards that you can give uh, give your staff. They're small little cards that fit in your wallet. Um, Polaris as well has um, a really good listing available at no cost, but same thing. They're, they're one pagers, if not like a small card um, that you can keep with you, put right at your front desk, uh, the back of the house, wherever you find that there's constant uh, interaction with guests or folks that interact with guests. Um, so definitely, Perfect. and then through our, our training as well, um, you gain, you, you'll see the list in the training, but you also gain access to those one pagers. And then my other question would be, how would you combat people who maybe tend to second guess themselves? Because of course, everybody's probably worried like, okay, maybe this is just a rebellious teenager with her dad and that's why she's uncomfortable and now I've totally offended a normal guest who has normal family problems. How do you kind of walk that fine line between suspecting everybody and not suspecting enough? Yeah, they, it really, that's a, an excellent point. It really is a fine line. I'll tell you, after I had uh, done that training, when you start it, they tell you that you might have some type of a PTSD uh, afterwards, and it's true. You start suspecting every scenario as a, a potential trafficking victim uh, in front of you or that you are potential to become one um, at any given time. But um, it, there, there's no clear answer um, of exactly what is the best way, I would say, from what I've heard is successful with our hoteliers, it's through observation and taking note of what you see. There have certainly been false claims and there's uh, more news coming out about false claims of uh, folks calling on exactly what you said, uh, like a father with uh, his young daughter um, going away. Uh, one of the signs they, they say to look for is if uh, folks are showing up with any luggage, if they have a local address but they have no luggage, um, or if they have luggage but no um, tag on the luggage itself suggesting that they flew in from somewhere. Those are different signs that might uh, come up as a red flag. I would say keep track of what you're seeing, keep record, time stamp things. Um, and if it gets to the point where your suspicions are just, uh, you know, just going off, your spidey senses, then uh, hopefully if you have not developed a, a relationship with the local law enforcement to see who, who would actually be on the Human Trafficking Task Force, um, you can still call yeah, Polaris hotline or um, 911 and ask them to come in, but let them know what the full story is um, and ask that they come in quietly um, before they, you know, go straight to the door knocking to see what's going on. I, I noticed that this is based and I put the link for the best uh, alliance with the, uh, in, the, in the chat box, but I also then I see that it's based in Seattle and they have Seattle numbers on this. It's just nauseating. I'm oh. sorry. To say. It just, oh, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. I threw them off to the side. Just some of the stuff that's there and the things that they're pointing out. It's just, I mean, just in Seattle, you would not think, given Seattle, you you know, we travel through Seattle, you know, it, it, we, we talk about, you know, cities to visit and so forth. And it's indicative of every city, as you pointed out in our earlier conversations, Cap. This isn't one place. This isn't, you know, New York. Oh, my gosh, it's a terrible. Every city has this issue. When I mean, I'm in Southwest Florida, and it comes up in the issues where, you know, they're they're discovering uh, the the you know the rural areas or what have you that the labor is a big issue. The, the labor trafficking is a huge issue down here with the seasonality of cropping and so forth that's still in existence. There's a lot of people that are coerced into it, albeit not a hotel issue, but it is in a sense because we're all feeding this. We're all allowing this out of out of ignorance and awareness to pass through our doors. 
and 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 not willingly. I mean, just uh, again, it's a lack of awareness or appreciation that this is such a skill. We think it's a one-off thing, as as you point out, Lily. It's the old guy and the young girl that looks nervous. Yeah, that's probably stereotypical, but there's probably a lot of other variations that we don't even blink an eye at that happen because of of the fact that we just. It's none of my business or, you know what, I don't want to be put into a position where I've now made myself uncomfortable or jeopardized our hotel because this person is going to rant and rave about, you know, that's my daughter or that's my son or whatever it is. And yet, as you pointed out, transgenders and LBG community people and so forth that are disemboweled from our communities are being thrown into these situations of exploitation. And we're allowing these things to happen out of ignorance. And that's the biggest thing I want to make sure that we, you know, not just this one show that we get to have you on, Cap, but hopefully a second time to bring this up and 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 make more of an odd of a voice to it is is this is this is awareness. This is fixable, not, not completely solvable, but fixable to a higher degree by awareness, just by paying attention to the stuff. I'd much rather be embarrassed by asking and being and 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 and, and getting at them upset that I at least asked than to not have asked and found out that person was on the side of the road because I'm from a tragedy. You know, right. so it is it is just even these numbers just for the Seattle region, uh, oh. you know, oof. and anyway. Seattle, Seattle had a huge, huge, huge problem with it. Um, but again, these are enterprising business people, right? It's it's a large industry. And why would you want to Yeah, you know, people would say, oh, well, look around Los Angeles, look around, you know, border, border cities and like that. If you go someplace like Seattle, there's less awareness, there's less scrutiny mm -hmm. and yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So they will, you know, they will find places like that where they can, you know, they're less likely to be detected and that's where they'll set up shop, you know? So, and I yeah, think so it's that's also, why they cross the board, all the hotels nationwide understand it is a huge, hugely beneficial initiative. I think also, you know, it kind of gets a reputation from what I understand and I'm not well educated on the topic, so I'll paraphrase by saying that first, but um, that I think we talk a lot about the border states, like I'm in Arizona, for example, they talk a lot about that with the cartels that can be involved and whatnot, but I think we sometimes overlook the fact that there are people within the U.S. trafficking girls from within the U.S. or people oh, from within the U.S. And so it's not simply a border problem, I think. Mm -hmm. Right. No, no and most of, yeah, I think there's one of the stat. Um, in Seattle, Lauren said, you know, 300, 500 children are prostituted, and most of them are American, right? Sort of thing. So, yeah, it's uh, and that's the rough. age group. It's just, it, it is, it's just it really. It, when I just pulled up the site and I pulled that out of it, my stomach just went, ah, oh. you know, this is happening now. This isn't just a historical mm -hmm. statistic. This is an ongoing, present thing. Yeah. And it just, it, 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 it is just amazing that. And then I applaud Alhoa for taking the initiative. You taking the initiative. To, yeah, absolutely. To put this into the it, culture in the discussion. It uh, sounds like uh, one of the most critical things is making sure that you have set up a communication log or something within the hotel for people observing. Because if a if one housekeeper observes it and they don't say anything, and another one does, they think it's one offs. But if there was a system of communication, any chance there's an app that hotels can get? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, not not that uh, I have heard of as yet, and um, that is a, a very good idea. I know I've uh, advised on just adding into your daily log or daily uh, note taking that you share with other staff. But um, that's certainly the direction we're going in, right? To yeah. add an app. You know, a couple of groups, I, I would say, um, you know, the folks at Alice would probably not the not the meeting the, the app guys, um, ALIC. Um, Alice would probably be very interested in it. I would think the beekeeper folks who do a lot mm -hmm. of you know, apps for you know, kind of back office ERP, you know, staff communication, those those groups and those people would be all over it. I mean, they're great folks and I, I would think they would they would be very, very supportive of, uh, well, of adding some, some specialized functionality because, again, it's a lot of what they do is log these things and their analytics of what's happening, um, and you may yeah. be able to do that, which, which would be very helpful. Right. So. Well, you, well, also, on, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, on, on that, um, the, the topic of uh, needing panic buttons and things for your housekeepers, if you're able to have that live, real-time, hey, don't go into room 512 without knocking five times. Um, like, don't just bust open because, you know, you could potentially get hurt or you don't know what's waiting behind the other mm -hmm. door. Um, so having that real-time communication definitely would make a difference. 
Yeah. Well, you bring up a very good point to it because it, it, it also means, and, and there is this, no, I wouldn't say rift, there is this distinction between management's perception and reality of operation. And um, the staff sometimes may feel intimidated uh, to report things that make their, 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 as you say, spidey senses tingle. Like, you know, there's a lot of people that they can tell when this kind of stuff is going on, okay? <laughs> and then and, and they can see that there's something different about this room or different about what, what is going on in a certain floor or something. Yet they might feel less likely to come forward because they themselves might be chastised that they uh, put the manager in a bad position because it wasn't what they thought it was or something. So the management, the ownerships, and, and everybody that's responsible for the communication of how the culture of that hotel runs needs to make it say it's okay. I'll take the heat if I'm wrong, but make sure that, you know, you keep your awareness about this, not with, but this isn't just a line item in a conversation like, okay, guys, watch out for human trafficking and then move on to the next thing saying checkbox, said something about it. No, allow the culture to support the idea that they could be wrong without recourse that it's better to have been wrong and, and thought of it than it is for them to have been wrong about not saying it. So it has to come from the management perspective too. Yeah. Um, I have uh, heard, I can't remember if it was West Baton Rouge. There was uh, recently I was in another, uh, one of those town hall training tours and um, the, the local law enforcement officials had mentioned that they have an uh, incentive program where if your business, not just the hotel, if your business reported it and they ended up um, finding that the case was true and took down whomever it was, um, they would reward the staff along with whomever reported the, uh, the oh. incident. So there are some local programs. Uh, another reason why it's worth getting involved uh, locally with not only your government officials, but uh, law enforcement, there, there might be other programs to incentivize not only you, but your staff to keep an eye out. Mm -hmm. No, very good point. I think it's so funny that like there are fundamental ways of being a good business person and everything that you've talked about is really just one of those fundamental ways. Have a good relationship with your local law enforcement, your local government. Like I, we've been telling PMs this since day one for a variety of reasons. Be kind to everyone. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, all of these things are like, okay. <laughs> sort of, uh, and then communicate with one another. Have a log when you're spotting discrepancies. Could be handy. Yeah, no, very good points. It, it, it seems like it too. You know, the uh, other industry that has uh, an opportunity here are um, the emergency rooms. Um, actually, that happens to be the one place where traffic victims get dropped off where they do not have the supervision because they're not legally permitted in the room with them everywhere. Um, oh, when one. I had done training, there was uh, somebody that worked in the ER. Um, I can't remember what her role was, but um, she mentioned that she had seen some victims before and it was uh, she was actually able to speak with them openly, um, but mm. they were always very scared. And she said that she was very surprised at how many male victims were brought in because um, they were often told, well, you know, man up, uh, deal with the pain and move on. You don't, you know, you don't tell anybody about it. You just take take the hit on the chest and keep moving. Um, yeah. So it, she opened our eyes to how many more uh, male victims there were. Um, yeah. And we're taught so often to assume that it's a female victim. So. Sure. Right. Yep. Just vulnerable people, you know, regardless of, of where they are. And actually, another group who might be um, really good would be OEO. Who's you know again because they're converting a lot of you know relatively low end properties that were independent that sort of thing where again this can be just absolutely rampant where who knows what the you know the owners of those properties are doing that you know groups like that that's again I, they are certainly not looking for hits that's great yeah, yeah. I would think they, yeah. that would be a, a primary thing for Calvin and those guys to really look after so. Yeah, yeah so their members and quite a few state lodging associations through our program with BEST were able to um, also create affiliate programs with state lodging associations. So they're also tied into almost every brand. Um, and we work directly with the brands to, to try and offer trainings through them. And of course, I look at things a lot more evilly, but if you produce a list of all the people who resist participating, that might help. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, I see. This organization must be in support of it because they haven't signed up. Huh? That's that's very odd. So. There, there's well, um, an online group on a, a that started up um, that had mentioned 
possibly adding like on Expedia or the different OTAs having some oh, type yeah. of a, a little tag or a badge or something to indicate that the hotel property does not support human trafficking um, and or that they are certified in uh, some shape or way uh, yeah. against Probably a level, I mean, almost in a way, a level of progression because there is the basic awareness, which is good to say that the hotel's even taking the initiative, but then there should be also the rewards of the hotels and, and the businesses that take additional initiatives that go beyond just the, okay, let's talk about it and checkbox it and we, you know, but then to say, well, this is what we're doing more about it. This is what we've implemented in, into our process and procedures. This is, this is our drills or whatever, you know what I mean? Where, uh, they've, they've, they've accelerated that and especially for the, the, the high probability areas. I mean, to your point where you're calling brands out like Oyo, I mean, I would call Red Lions out. I would call anybody that has oh, yeah. intermediary inventory in different locations that are between locales and so forth. As, as you point out, Kat, it's not just a metro area, border town thing. This is rampant through the entire United States and beyond. Mm -hmm. It's not just the U.S. issue, but in, in, in context of our conversation. And it's in Midwest. It is in the small towns. It is everywhere. So right. these hotels that are in these locations are just, if not even potentially more vulnerable because there is less staff, there is less engagement, there is less threshold of usabilities to the product. And, and those places are probably more prone to the, as you say, this, this slide and disappear things where people can just blend into the process of life and not be looked at differently than, than before. So, yeah. Well, and, uh, and as... And as you know, covert businesses, they don't necessarily want to be in super high occupancy, super high ADR environments. I mean, that's bad. That it's greater risk of being detected. Sure. It's well, they greater, stand out. Yeah. It's it's higher. You know, it's higher cost, which eats into their profit. I mean, though, it's really kind of the more you know outlying properties that would be a would be predominantly yeah. used for these. So yeah. Well. I don't mean to keep the, I mean, it's an incredibly important topic, but I also just want to drag us down into despair and feeling bad. <laughs> yeah. Happy yeah, Thanksgiving, everyone. Reality's there. Yeah, reality's right. there. I do want to take away from the reality of a any stretch, and I don't want to demean it by any means, and I want to make sure that it lingers in the, in the value proposition, but I don't want us to go two hours later going, this day sucks. But, you know, so. <laughs> Yeah. You did also have another topic that you were very much passionate about talking about today, and I'm really happy Lily joined us as well, as well as oh, I, uh, Holly, obviously, Robert, not so much, but you know, and that is, wow. <laughs> and that is your, your data-driven conversation, because Robert doesn't know anything about that, so don't worry about Robert talking, but you know, Lily will be a great contributor to this conversation, but you want to, Kat, you want to talk a little bit about data-driven te uh, communication technology and usability, so please, if we want to change gears a little bit and go into something like that, would be great. Certainly. So yes, um, I, uh, this stems from earlier this year, I went to the Ishe conference and we did a think tank session with um, uh, many of the hospitality executives that were there. Some were directors of education, others were in ops or their senior VPs, uh, president, vice president, so on. Um, but we, our think tank was uh, to determine how many associations um, we're really using collecting data and then using that data to drive their decision making as far as education. I focused just on educational programming um, and found that it was about two thirds of the audience that were collecting data and using the data, um, but the the data that was collected um, fell into these gray areas of how applicable is it to the decisions you're really making. Um, most of them seemed to be during the event they had heard feedback about what folks didn't like to eat or uh, you know maybe a particular speaker but it wasn't necessarily looking at the attendance report to see how much fly-in traffic they have versus local drive-in traffic and how you can differ your marketing based on that um, but uh, the think tank really highlighted the fact that data is not data might be collected but it's not being analyzed in the most beneficial and useful way that it could be so um, from that we uh, we looked at where we look at data and would recommend others to and I had a, a quick list here but um, we have a lot of member interactions so your guest interactions um, or clients where uh, we hear from them directly, we might survey them directly uh, about specific questions uh, or you know, what would you like to see, what's your feedback on this event on different topics and collect that information. We talk to our vendors, industry partners similarly. 
on advocacy. We have a team that works in DC that um, advocates on the behalf of hoteliers. So what are they hearing from the legislation standpoint? What do we need to be made aware of? Because if there's something coming down the pike to, that will be impacting our members, then we should get ahead of it and offer some type of education. Um, our webinar statistics, um, AHOLA produces 100 unique webinars each year, so we can look at which topics are most popular, which ones have greater attendance live versus download, um, and derive some trends in analytics. Times of year um, makes a difference. Um, let's see, of course, uh, post and pre-event surveys, member calls, um, and of course, uh, Lily, I'd love to hear uh, if any of these uh, apply from your standpoint. Um, we look at member calls. Being that we service uh, the whole U.S., we have members that call in to uh, one of uh, our staff attorneys, or our staff attorney, we have one, and um, she'll let us know what trends she's seeing, which are the top five topics that she's called about, and oftentimes it's ADA or human trafficking um, or some legislation, something that we can just offer some more education on. Um, it won't uh, offer a solution for everybody, but... Um, it, it takes care of some of it um, and reduces those member calls that we receive. Um, we look at marketing statistics, what type of clicks we're getting, who's following through all the way to the registration page, et cetera, and analyzing that. Um, and of course, industry data, what's going on, uh, what are our uh, KPIs looking like, and how does that compare to what our members are saying in various parts of the US. Um, and from there, we develop our education programming. We found that our members had greater demand, uh, for example, um, on development and acquisitions um, and management companies. So we created How to Form Management Company. We partnered with uh, Alice, uh, the events one, <laughs> to uh, work on investment uh, content. Um, but we're looking directly at the data from the events and uh, different benefits that we offer uh, to s decide whether we need to take some off, add more on, or work uh, elaborate more on some. So uh, dis data decision making is just, I'm just such an advocate of it. I feel like we're, we already function with uh, always needing more staff. So to become more efficient, um, it just helps in the overall process. So really, what do you have? What comes to mind? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a big fan of data. data. Yeah. Uh, no, I agree. I think that, you know, that in it, in and of itself, even though you're using it to service the member programs more, I think that it's also a great topic in and of itself for your members because I think that there's a lot of hoteliers who still make a lot of gut feelings and Certainly there's room for some gut decisions in the hospitality industry, like with revenue management, it's not necessarily math. A lot of it's psychology and different things, but if you have a robust data program and you have a data cleanliness program to make sure that you're using good data, I think everybody makes better decisions when they're presented with numbers because the beauty of the language of numbers coming from a revenue manager is that you can't interpret the number two. It's just the number two. You know, it just it, there's no emotion around numbers. And so when you have robust data sets that are collected properly and used properly, the decision making process becomes a lot easier and we're able to kind of test opinions, we're able to test all different things against data. So I really applaud you for using that to help drive um, some of your decisions. I think conversely to argue with myself, if you're gathering this from your member base, then there may be a little bit of a, they don't know what they don't know. So there may be at other education programs that they don't know that they're interested in because they simply don't know the topic exists or they don't realize, you know, a lot of people think that they're an expert in something. I always think back to my early days in hotels when I considered myself an intermediate Excel user and then I met one. Uh, and it turns out I knew very little about Excel. Um, so I think that it really just depends on the level of knowledge that you're starting from, but it's a good way to lay a foundation for your training programs. I have a tool I want to share. It's a toy. I love toys. Uh, it's uh, called Giru.com. Does it come and from AppSumo, Lauren? 
No, it doesn't. Actually, it doesn't, what? which is scary. I, I This is from another source, JV Zoo. Uh, oh, okay. But anyways, um, I'm starting to use this. I'm, I'm using it beyond or differently than what it was intended. Um, <laughs> but what it does is if it's, you know, it, it, there's lots of great platforms out there, Tableau, R, and so forth, but you really have to be good at understanding how you contrive the data, the constructed data, to put it in correctly so that the, the results, the information, the answers you're looking for come out based on the accuracy of the data and not your complicities of how you put the data in. It's, I mean, it's not necessarily garbage in, it's literally how you construct it in sometimes. The data may be good, but how you put it in and the correlations you try to create can be very really strange if you don't know really what you're doing. You have to have a really good sense. Like you said, Lily, you know, until you met somebody that was intermediate in Excel, you realized how little you knew. You thought you were pretty smart with if-then conditionals and that's like, yeah, that's basic. <laughs> <laughs> Multivariate analysis are given, a little okay? more complicated. Yeah. yeah, right. There's a lot more to it than that. And Excel does amazing things. But what's cool about this little platform, if you just want to scroll through some of the this, this stuff off the page of it, is wow. what I'm building with it is I'm building, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of workflow for, for CRM interfaces, where it's a conditional relationship of as you send communications, they contrive triggers as to what you do. But this is really cool because you can put in your direct costs, your implied costs, you can put in your modeling from a marketing point of view, your conversions, your volumes of traffic, your conditionals as to where it goes. And then the really part that the part that I really like is all your other conditionals, your your retargetings and so forth that have percentage contribution value propositions in it. It's just not a single pathway that people go through, as we know, in their interactions. Well, the cool part about it is you're pointing out, uh, uh, Tad, about the, the data use is you have all this data of the things you're already currently doing, your marketing strategies, your cost of operations and all these things. This is a cool little, it's a cheat sheet that you can build your own constructs in and put in your costs and put in your known entities of this is how much traffic I get, this is how much conversion I get when it comes to marketing or from an operational perspective, this is my product cost, this is my labor cost, this is my, my actual transition of tra transaction values and so forth. And it gives you the ability to do a simplified model of um, whether you're profitable or not, or whether it's going to cost you too much. It allows you to actually play with the numbers before you trigger the month to spend. And to your point about this data, I mean, it doesn't solve all the data things you're talking about. You're talking about data usage in a variety of ways, well beyond just the math of marketing or the math of operations. You're talking about data usage in the way of, of, of sales awareness and operation awareness and staff awareness and so forth. But this is just a kind of a neat fragment of the conversation where it gives you a chance to kind of just construct out. I always like when Robert stares at the screen like, because I know he's looking at the, 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 the website, like, oh, it does that. But anyways, so I just want to contribute to your point of conversation, the data you know, it is, it is not, it's not out of reach. You don't need to hire Einstein here to go over and do this stuff for you. Sometimes it's just sticking a stick in the sand and taking one step forward and saying, let me get one step better at my Excel understanding, or let me get one step better at what data I have and what can I do with this data? And this was just one of those kind of fun ones that I've been messing with. I use this for um, uh, proposals a lot where I'm literally will construct out when we're doing campaign stuff and say, Hey, look, if we do this based on these numbers, you're going to possibly do this. doesn't mean you're going to. It just means it's, there's a probability of it. Um, by the same token, if those numbers aren't accurate, or where do we need to massage the numbers to make them proper? Where do we need to create improved conversion or improved volume of traffic or improved uh, feeders to it, you know, additional retargetings that can contribute to the overall result or something? So. Anyway, it was my it was the show and tell part portion of today. <laughs> but, but that's the it most important. A, a question I'm, I'd like to pitch. Oh. Go ahead, okay. Robert. Go ahead. Oh, no, oh, go okay. ahead. Um, I was thinking it prompted a question I wanted to repose to you all um, on the topic of data. Have you ever had the data analytics and came up with these great conclusions, produced something from it, and it still failed? Oh yeah, and absolutely. <laughs> If you learn something from uh, Lord, you got so excited. Oh, yeah. a, better, a, better question <laughs> is, a better question is how many campaigns have you done where you've projected the results and they have come out exactly because you had every variable perfectly <laughs> scaled? And that never happens, right? So it the happens most really important, all the time. No, no, the most, it happens yeah, to well, Lauren, right yeah, 
Vlorin yeah. is yeah zero defect environment in terms of absolute six sigma productivity on on all of his forecasting campaigns, but no, no. but the most important thing is you benchmark. Here is what we believe is going to happen, and if you have good analytics that have kind of backed up your recommendations going, we've got a really pretty good idea. And you can do a best case, worst case, and yeah, most likely case scenario, which is a great way to do it. And then you measure it and you have a benchmark. You say, huh, look at that. We got more traffic or less. Oh, we got less traffic, but better conversion. So yeah, maybe it kind of netted out to be the same, but you can start figuring those things out. And then you can really start learning and improving. And and that's the key to the analytics is, is not just, mm -hmm. here's some numbers at the front, here's some bottom line at the end, but what are the little levers you can tweak to then kind of learn and improve and, and go? And that's, that's how you get success on these programs. So yeah, I like this tool for the funnel. Yeah, the, the very, very cool tool for, uh, for really looking right. at funnel planning. It's funny because I literally, up. yesterday, I got a Facebook ad for this exact tool. So it's Did kind you? of funny. Um, but I, I'm curious, Katya, because you're doing so much data collection, what sort of tools are you using to bring in all of this data from your members and the feedback and whatnot? How do you collect it and make it cohesive and usable? So I'd say we have multiple platforms. Um, probably most common would be our webinars through Google Analytics, um, and we also have some in-house uh, data analytics individual, uh, Stephen Doss, shout out. Um, he uh, takes all of our data and analyzes it, so I just am able to give him what I'm looking for and then gain the stats. Um, our member calls, and so, uh, a lot of those are done by handy dandy Excel where we uh, just kind of track things and uh, add them up and uh, we track uh, differences month to month. Um, like all of our webinars, um, my partner in crime is Steve Wolfenbarger. He's a education manager at AHOA. Um, every month we look at the difference from last month in every single webinar um, and all of our resources that are on our resource library. Um, so it's a bit time consuming. Um, and there's, we're moving towards making this much easier. Uh, we have recently added a new AMS system. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The it, it's through ProTech. It's a CRM uh, dynamics database. But um, we're actually able now to see when our members register for events. Um, it attaches to their account, so we're able to just pull reports that can tell me more about who's attending what. Um, the frequency of uh, registration and so on, where um, we didn't have that before. So that's brand new. Like we're still in the the final development stages of being able to pull that data through our CRM database. Uh, we also use GoToWebinar for analytics and uh, SurveyMonkey to collect data. Mm -hmm. Do you do uh, NPS for your training classes and uh, Net Promoter Score? I do not, but I will definitely. No, nope. just jotted that down. You oh. shouldn't. Uh, the, oh, no. You know, <laughs> NPS is very effective uh, in a lot of ways. Obviously, from a product standpoint, and I just I've only recently been reading a bit about from a training standpoint how it's not the most uh, effective indicator, which is surprising to me. Uh, it can be a little bit misleading. It, it's so we. Uh, your net promoter score in a product is so critical. If somebody's going to recommend you or uh, talk to somebody about you, it's usually such a good indicator if you're going in the right direction, if you have promoters or detractors. But in the world of training, uh, it's been given some uh, false leads, apparently. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was going to actually suggest you don't. I mean, look into it, but I, I wouldn't. Probably now, is that it. because people tend to grade yeah, things higher? Think, uh, they give it a nine or a ten. No, or, uh, they don't want to share. Or it just isn't correlated. It just doesn't don't correlate. Wanna, it doesn't seem to correlate. It, uh, okay. My theory is uh, they may not want to share this great resource that they found with competitors. Uh, you know, there's a wide variety, but it doesn't correlate. Is the issue? Yeah. Hmm. Which I would uh, to um, Lily's point though. Uh, I'm excellent at arguing with numbers. Two is often an opinion to me, so I don't know if you can completely say that. You should, you know. yeah. Well, no, and, and we found that with some Very GD true. Out, and you know, I think it might be audience. 
Go ahead. Oh, I think Robert was going. No, no, you're fine. Go ahead. Oh, no, I'm fine. loving this. <laughs> Cut him right off. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep going. Oh, I was going to say, it might be audience-based. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, for example, our, our members, we actually put on a survey how they find out uh, most about events, and the number one response was word of mouth through their peer. So uh, if it's a, a technology-based a collection or rating system, um, it just may not fit the audience uh, as well. So our our best data is going to come from that personal interaction um, with our members. Now I wonder now, and, and Holly, just to keep it in the spirit of the fact that you now you go out and you have, and I'm not trying to toot your horn about this, but I'm always happy to see you. You have this amazing sales training program, and when you successfully train people, I can see you know, your perspective of it, that they may not want to share an NPR of a, a high score for you to promote what you're doing for their competitors to discover what they feel is their, 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 their skill set they learned from you. They don't want others to find out about it. They want to keep it themselves. Yet I'm thinking in some ways, like from a membership uh, organization, like Alhoa, if they keep it culturally within themselves, then it's a validation or endorsement of the value proposition of the membership. Like, yes, Anybody that's a member of the organization should take this program because it's it's a value proposition. It's blah, 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 whatever it is. Net consumers are great. I think also there may be more honesty with a membership evaluation because they're going to want the membership to always excel at their value proposition. So they may be more willing to be critical about the presentation saying, yeah, it wasn't up to what I would expected. And so I'm not giving it a great net promoter score because I expect my organization to be at this caliber and this didn't match that line. So maybe in some ways, it, you know, just depending upon to the audience of it, you're, you have a retail product in essence in some ways that once it's discovered, nobody wants anybody else in their market to have it. They don't want the hotel to find out what they learned from you. But meanwhile, from a membership perspective, they might be like, hey, you know, my membership uh, is worth it. And I want to let people know that this, this is a good thing to do if they're a member, you know. That's, yeah, I think it's important to differentiate between a training and a membership. I mean, that's, I, I was surprised to read this information about NPS score, scores because I've always been a huge NPS. It's just the easiest uh, thing in the world to track. You've got detractors, you've got promoters, and, you know, it's a piece of cake. And I was surprised to read this uh, research about the training side of it. So just be cautious mm. there. I know from a cultural thing, I mean, I'm working with the HSMI uh, APAC, that um, the, the, their measurement of whether they successfully do a campaign with the Japanese uh, uh, culture is very profound on the return uh, aspect of people coming back to the next edition or other program, where they never get a bad score from anything they do when they go to Japan. Everybody rants and raves in words and in scoring about the program. But if it doesn't have a great return audience, that's the real measure because for they, what they find out from, the, from their culture is it's very polite and they will not truly say it was bad. They'll say words that other people will interpret from the culture that, you know, this was wonderful and happy. And they're like, oh, well, that's not worth going. But they'll never use words like bad or, or you know, insufficient, but they'll just won't come back again. And that's the real measure. And even when they contact them and say, we, did, we didn't see you at the next episode. Oh, yeah, no, I, your last one was really great and wonderful, but we just couldn't this, this, and this. There's an excuse to it. And that was the real measure of whether or not the campaign resonated or the program resonated within the, with the, uh, the culture at that point. And yet, meanwhile, um, you know, when it comes to like Singapore and other places, they're almost blatantly honest, <laughs> where they'll be very critical even though they enjoyed it. They'll, they'll give it two stars, but they'll talk how great it was. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. and you're like, well, why did I get only two stars? Well, you know, the coffee wasn't good. What does that have to do with the program? <laughs> right. So yeah, they, it, it's, it's, there is some culture variances, I think, too, is to the perspective of the value proposition. Of it. Qualitative and oh, quantitative right. as well. With yeah. the, yep. What they yeah. write versus how they write. Yeah, very yeah. true, very true. Oh, yeah. NPS is a great, it is a measure, but it's not the only one, right? Because yeah, and, right. And the work do with like JD Power. Yes. And we work with Bain on, on NPS and that's great. And it's all you know, the official way to do it. Um, but then, you know, JD Power has its own metric for 
for basically customer satisfaction. And then there's the likelihood to return, right? So you have three different metrics which do not always align in complete lockstep because again, on NPS, seven and eight scores don't count basically, right? right. At all. No. And that's and that's okay. And, and yeah, you can get a good indicator. You get a nine or a 10, you get a point. If you get a zero to six, you get a minus, you know, a negative. But seven and eights don't count and that's not always you know the, the sweet spot for these uh, these brands. So you have to look at multiple factors when you're when you're looking at it. it's it's like anything. If you just look at one score, right, you may be scoring well on that. But does that really indicate what what translates into profit and return guests into satisfaction in the bottom line? And well, this does not have a one to one correlation for doing that. So. There, therein lies, though, the danger of being data-driven, mm -hmm. uh, I think, because you can be data-driven in completely the wrong way. We just had a big discussion in the marketing advisory board last week about attribution modeling. And 70% mm -hmm. of the group, were you surprised, Robert? 70% of the group used last click? <laughs> oh, absolutely. The hotel industry is so far behind. Yeah. Right, and, and I tried. I tried to pipe up with even the basics that are in, in Google Analytics, and there are a variety of others. And and the data-driven one in Google Analytics is the best one because it basically winds up being a, a regression analysis. Right, you look at all your data points, and you look at the outcomes, and then you you try to figure out what has the highest correlation between some sort of input and the and the end result. Right, and you can kind of figure out. Well, yeah, here's how the attribution kind of gets spread out. Um, again, a, a thing that we do in JD Power is how do you wind up? What drives customer satisfaction? And it drives some of the hoteliers nuts. Where we go, yeah, reservations is about three to four percent influence on guest satisfaction. They go, that's ridiculous, and that's bad. it's like we aren't making up these numbers. We're using regression analysis to kind of go, here's what the satisfaction says. And guess what? The reservation satisf you know, the reservation factor isn't a big predictor of satisfaction. Here are some other things that are much, much greater uh, predictors of that satisfaction. So not that it's not important, but if you're really trying to drive satisfaction, here what are is the it? things you need to work on. Oh, there, there, there are a variety of, um, <laughs> there's, there's certainly um, product, product issues, um, guest staff interaction issues. Uh, uh, there are a variety of them, food and beverage quality. Uh, there, there are a ton of them that wind up getting, you know, in the 22 to 20% impact on guest satisfaction, again, versus reservations. But again, reservation is important. You certainly want to attract traffic convert it effectively and do that or you aren't going to have guests to be satisfied so it's just a different kind of measure right so uh, i worked with uh harrah's casinos a couple of years ago they hmm. were phenomenal uh oh, yeah. about tracking loveman he totally tracked worked. everything oh, yeah. yeah exactly yeah. they knew i mean I i've never seen such a phenomenal data-driven company since then i don't know if they still are Casinos, they, casinos. Yeah, casinos. Yeah. Yeah. And it is. And, you and, know, and, yeah, and Loveman and those guys, what they were doing, it, it was incredible, especially in their player stats. Yeah. They would go out and they would find people. And again, it all came up with the cards, right? Use the cards and you're a total rewards member and your play is tracked. So they'd go, oh, you seem to be playing and you love Wheel of Fortune or whatever. Um, and you're losing, right? So they would have the casino host come up in near real time and go, Lauren, hey, and they know you're down 250 bucks on Wheel of Fortune. They can direct you over to, they'll give you $50 of player credit on the spot, put another game and figure out that, hey, these are people who loved Wheel of Fortune. This has better gameplay and oh, guess what? It has better ROI for the, for the casino as well. So they will... I'm I'm not sure if it's evil or not, right? But it's <laughs> it's a better experience for the for the player and more profitable for the casino. And they've given you something of value, which you've then just given back to the house as well. <laughs> but they do that, and people are happy and they're thrilled because they've been recognized, they've been helped, and they've lost more money. 
Right. Yeah. You know, I think oh. I may be taking this in a slightly different direction. I apologize because I lost you there for a minute, but just kind of had a thought on the guest satisfaction and measuring of that metric um, and how sometimes you get, you know, not quite clear feedback to Lauren's point a minute ago. I actually encourage people to, if they have enough of a subset, pull out only the guests who said that they had an issue at your hotel oh, yeah. and make that your data set because you know, number one, they're being honest. And number two, oddly enough, from what we find, it's guests who have an issue that is resolved to or beyond their satisfaction that are most likely to be net promoters instead of the ones who've had no, no problems issue. at all. So right. ideally, you don't want it to be a big issue, but if you almost look at, if you just pull those to the side, then that may actually give you more accurate data if you have a large enough subset of people who say at least like, you know, I needed extra towels in the room, really any type of staff interaction to your point. Oh, um, yeah. Major hotel group um, presented the uh, results of you know, running around the country presenting these guys. Um, major hotel group had one brand that was just cratering in terms of numbers of issues that they were having, right? You could see you have a significantly higher number of issues, not only versus your sister brands, but versus you know your competitive set and your chain scales and things like that. And these issues are not being satisfactorily resolved and it's killing your customer satisfaction. And oh, the pushback. Oh, we don't know about these numbers and question them, it's like, you know, whistle, time out, but you loved all these numbers for the brand that's doing quite well. I mean, that's it's the same data methodology, driven. Yeah. guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, we don't want to believe those numbers. And it's like, we're really sorry. We aren't putting our thumb on the scale. This is 45,000 people across the country, across all these brands. It's just, we're reporting what they're saying. And you should really probably be receptive to this because this brand is sucking at what you're doing and it's probably really fixable because look at what's happening in food and beverage on your other brands. Yeah, so that's, that's it. There has to be some revenue correlation that they see. Oh, there is. Oh, and, and yeah. there absolutely is. Yeah. So. So, so going back to with the fact that with our guest cat, we hit the two topics you definitely wanted to hit. Was there any more residual ones that you wanted to make sure we get thrown into the process? Or is there any expansion to any of them that you want to make sure can, we, can, we hit before Robert can I, tries to uh, Can I ask Kat what you've learned from a topic standpoint is relevant for hoteliers from a training standpoint? I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just actually, curious. The of, uh, sales and marketing um, is a big one. Our the ones that are always at the top are anything HR law related, anything ADA compliance related. Um, if there are any legislation uh, actions that hoteliers need to take, uh, example the MIPP training in California, where it could result in fines or fees. Um, but sales and marketing consistently comes up and is actually one of our most sought after downloaded webinars um, because this set it and forget it way of uh, revenue management or hey they're discounting I'm going to discount by a dollar um, it's it's still a little too prevalent um, but on the topic of sales and marketing that I wanted to bring up with you uh, Holly that I thought you might be able to comment on is recently um, we had two folks that work in the sales and marketing and then revenue management space brought up the fact that when uh, one hotel drops flags for another one, that there's a point where all of the systems that held their data, contacts, relationships, etc., goes away. So are hotels preparing for that transition and what does that transition look like? Um, and I was curious if that was something you had dealt with before uh, or if you could uh, kind of add to that topic. Uh, Lily? Lauren, these guys. It's ridiculous. Oh, yeah. It's ridiculous. Um, in some oh. cases, unfortunately, this is a brand business model. Uh, because especially when you have a lot of brands that have other properties in the area. Um, and in, in somewhat fairness to the brand, you've got yeah, you know, this backlog of reservations, right? Which is going to be, you know, changing of a flag or something. And they will aggressively go out and say, hey guys, 
you booked with X brand, it's not going to be that anymore. And they don't necessarily say that, yeah, your reservation is going to be recognized and it's the same management company and all these things and it'll probably be fine. It's more like, hey, we can help you and you'll get your points if you stay in a you know property B instead of this first one. And we will facilitate that and not just on a, on a transient basis, but on a group basis and somewhat structurally gut the hotel right from okay. from any of their their booking backlog um, happens very 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 often they, they, I'll tell you my secret my super secret sauce of following the law but not necessarily its intent <laughs> <laughs> both brands the one you're exiting and the one you're going to do not uh, prohibit cannot prohibit uh, you to have an identity in your transition process Mm -hmm. Now you don't have to name it the new hotel because there is a there is the binder between both brands that you cannot refer to your new brand to the old brand. You can't go to your old IHG database that you're transitioning from and say, "Hey, we're going to be the new Marriott brand." We can't do this, but mm -hmm. you can offer communication with your database while you still have connection to it in your IHG environment for contests, follow ups, social engagements, and you create a domain that is innocuous. That is mm -hmm. your, your transition email newsletter, like, hey, guys, sign up for discounts going forward. You're going to be staying with us in the future. We want to give you a reward for that. For those that are pre-booked already on the IHG platform, going to what, then you have to notify them, hey, guess what? You're not going to be coming to a Holiday Inn. You're going to be coming to a Marriott. You know, you, all those complexities of transition to brand. But if you create a neutrality place that you're doing these communications, you can garner legally all of the people that respond and engage with you into that platform and then use that as your core. Don't give it to your new brand, but take that data and then introduce them to your new brand, but maintain that data con that you've, uh, that you've garnered from the transition process. So you're fulfilling the transition from the brand that you're not putting them into a new brand because you can't feature the new brand and you're not violating the new brand by bringing in brand, not theirs data because it's yours in the transition process. So it's following the, the law of transition without necessarily the intent. <laughs> and it's it's the one area on the group sales side where we're actually a little bit ahead of the transient side. Group sales is behind the transient side in every other area. <laughs> uh, but we don't, you know, always convert the catering or group sales CRM system. We'll typically, mm -hmm. not typically, but often we'll stay the same. Yeah. Uh, if we're using Delphi before, we'll use Delphi after and so we don't lose the data. But hopefully at this point on the transient side, that's part of the cutover that they're doing this. Yes, yeah. no? Well, no. The, the problem is the limitations, I think, of the systems, especially if you're talking about a brand-to-brand -brand conversion, there's limitations to what you can pull out. So the Or brand-to-independent, really. So I always think back to one of the biggest projects I did was years and years ago um, down on the wharf in San Francisco, um, I assisted with the transition of the Hilton Fisherman's Wharf to what is now Pier 2620. And we went through massive rounds of Hilton cancellations because they weren't mm -hmm. going to get their points or they were trying to come and use points. That was the main reason that this hotel was transitioning because it was in such a prime location that they were making very little money off the brand because they were the redemption hotel where everybody mm -hmm. wanted to come use their points. So they are making so much more money now as an independent in this scenario, but it was definitely a painful transition because the only way that they could really get all of that historical information and reservations on the books was to hand enter them. So they had to run, there was a binder of reservations about this big that they had to bring in like 12 people just to hand key reservations nonstop for a couple of weeks to get mm -hmm. them all into their new opera system before the cutover so that they would be prepared. And that obviously there's a lot of room for error in a system like that, but there's mm -hmm. just no friendly transition out of a brand and into another brand or an independent scenario because the brands really want to hold on to those loyalty guests. And mm -hmm. I can't blame them. I well, mean, it's they're running a business just like anybody else, right? But there's definitely a lot of additional steps. And unfortunately, especially on the limited service side, we see a lot of hotel owners and operators who go into it not realizing what exactly is going to happen. And without somebody there to guide them, 
like a, a savvy revenue management consulting firm, for example, um, they are likely to run into challenges that once once you transition, you can't go back and correct. Mm -mm. It's kind of right. you know Gone. do it now or don't do it at all. Your opportunity is right. lost. Well, and the opposite the opposite happens as well, though. For an independent going into a major brand, I've been involved mm -hmm. with a, a group a, a major brand where I've had very pleasant conversations with really you know, chief legal officers and things like that um, where they've gone in where it's been a representation group or something like that which has been a commission based you know program and they go oh no after this we will not pay commission on these bookings they were like no no that's the, the thing and it's great to have nice frank conversation going oh I understand so you're going to accept the reservation without paying for it and um, boy I think there are certain racketeering charges which could you know re you really want and boy they say oh oh they do not like that but that's really what happens that's basically a RICO offense and yeah all of a sudden they start towing the line but if you don't if you don't have kind of knowledgeable advice coming in you're going don't let them push you around you will get pushed around right yeah. and because it's it's again it's a business and they're going to opportunistically do what they can do to you know reduce expense maximize revenue gain benefit based on leverage and you can't always let folks do well, behave that way so. if, if you want to look at a very realistic senses, so there are some things that, that hotel owners can do. This isn't a short conversation for a hotelier to change flags. This is a long, long conversation that begins. It's not like, hey, next month, let's change flags. It, you know when your, your contract is coming to a point that you're even allowed to make a decision. Uh, you're, put, you're, you know, you're reaching out to other brands to see what the incentive relationship of value of brand and everything else is. To, as soon as that thought process begins, there's ways to begin to extract data because data over 12 months old, as much as you would like to say it's worth something, is not really worth much. The actual value of its conversion value goes away a lot. I'll be away from sales because sales has I was a lot. say, yeah, except for on the you know, side. But from a transient point of view, anything past 12 months, 18 months at most, you're really looking at a very, very poor engagement value proposition. Um, because if they if they repeat guests, if they're a lifetime value guest proposition, they're back into that cycle within 18 months anyway. So the people that don't come back after you know in the past 18 months are probably less likely to be ones you're going to be gathering again anyway. Now they're great for other values, but not in this case. So if you begin to extract, even if it's simple as taking your arrivals list and to your point of manualization, Lily, they, they, they pulling it and throwing it into CSV files of this right. is your arrivals as they're coming in. And you build this list as time goes forward and when you make this transition, then all of that, even if it's a soft park, which I mean by taking all of that and making a custom audience on a social platform or a paid platform, that maybe you, you lose the individuality of the people, but you know this is a previous guest list. So now you at least have a platform of engagement you can get to them with, knowing that this list that you're using for targeting your ad campaigns is literally the people that staged your hotel in the past 12 to 12, 18 months. And you know, create that relationship because you can talk about yourself still in the in the current context of whatever hotel brand you are, and you then get to talk about them in the context of the new hotel brand you're going to be. Because social is not one of those things that fall into the brand transition requirements. You can you can transition who you are on social platforms in the process. So even if that that is a soft way of doing it, you can still do those kind of things. And actually, while I ascend my platform, and I think I can do this in under three minutes. Um, one way that might be able to do this in the future is maybe if there was a universal hospitality ID oh, that no, no. <laughs> existed from the previous hotel and had yeah. continuity to the next brand, um, you might be able to solve this from both but a distribution perspective and a, a hotel tech stack perspective. But Robert, who, I mean, who owns the data is what it comes down to. But the hotel owner should own the data because it is their data. Should, but doesn't. Wouldn't the hotel that's owner doesn't own doing. their data. But if there they, was a universal hospitality ID, that would facilitate that. And if it was a nonprofit sort of organization that served as a registry of this and had no real commercial interest in leveraging this data and moving it somewhere else or being acquired by someone, that certainly would be it. And oh my God. 
I just realized Hospitality Technology Next Generation has a work group which is working on exactly that thing. And oh my, I just remembered I'm co chair of that. Wow. <laughs> so, I what Robert, a coincidence. Robert, knew that was so coming. Is this going to work? <laughs> what? How is this going to work? So you have a Hilton. It's going to work like a registry the same way the DNS works for the internet, where you buy a website and you say, I've registered for that because you're Holly and you have influencer-sales.com and your DNS says the web server is pointed right over there and the mail server is over there. And that kind of seems to work for how the world works. And just imagine a hotel that and it seems all the hotels want to go on a on a tech stack perspective to some sort of service bus you could say oh my property management system is there oh my relationship with my brand is there my management company is there and you control those relationships or you delegate it to someone who can control that and all of a sudden if you were to register for something like that it might work a lot like the internet works I have a hard time imagining that a Marriott who owns your data uh, mm -hmm. from your Wi-Fi, from your guests using your Wi-Fi, is mm -hmm. going to give up their data because your hotel's registered. Why would they give? Who are they giving it up to? To the What's hotel the owner? owner. Oh, so that's they're changing flags. <clears throat> no, no, that's that is the hotel owners. That, I mean, they are they are paying Marriott for that. That is not really Marriott's data, and Marriott should be Lauren? interested. It is Marriott's yeah. data. Oh, oh, if, for using right now, Marriott, Marriott right now, Marriott right now. If you pay for if you if they get a franchise fee off of anything, then mm -hmm. the data associated with that engagement is actually the brands. But it's not wholly the brands. They won't let you use it. Well, that's a very, that's a very, very good point. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I went through that exam. And, they literally changed quite the and quite honestly, because of me. So and, I know this is true. <laughs> no, and, quite, and quite honestly, with this, with this registration process, there will be an ID and you don't have to use it, right? And for the hoteliers, actually, the way this is going to be going to be structured is if the hotel brands don't want to participate, that's fine. But the ecosystem of tech providers can do that, and they can point to each other saying this. Now, this isn't the actual content of these of these messages, sort of thing. It's it's not a centralized repository. HNLA had a had a initiative which died. A, a gruesome, very expensive death a, a few years ago um, because they were trying to develop a centralized content repository. That's not a, this is just a registry that points to the resources. Now, how you I want to share those resources and validate, you know, and authenticate for who has access to it is a whole different thing that's a level above. This is just. I think, the, the, I think the process itself, what you're doing is absolutely pristine. I think it's excellent for this, but I think absolutely. this is a simple right into a contract that if you're going to be a Marriott, then you have to surrender your license value of the data that you're collecting as your Marriott while you're a Marriott. And that has you nothing to do with that. Has nothing I think that's to just going to be a right into a contract. Like, says, hey, look, right. if you're going to be a Marriott, then you license off the fact that whatever data you collect while you're us is ours, mm -hmm. period if they go into the system. Right now as it stands, when you flag as a Marriott, anything that you generate revenue from, that data that's collected to generate that revenue, if they make mm -hmm. any portion of the Marriott gets a percentage of it, is considered Marriott's brand proprietary data. Right. And that is usable for the prop by the property as long as the property remains brand. And Marriott is not ever giving that up unless but they are gonna to give it up when they hire the AI. You know, it, it really cracks me up because we're having this conversation and I'm really surprised it hasn't become more of a topic in the hotel industry because this is the exact thing that we give Expedia a hard time about is not sharing right. guest data. And, Absolutely. you know, we always say, like, everybody jumped into bed with the OTAs during the downturn because this and that. But it, aren't we doing the exact same thing with our own brands? And they just have a much better way of marketing it as if it's, our data, but it's only our data as long as we agree to brand. keep playing with them. That's actually right. But what mm -hmm. this what this um, initiative does for the registry is that unique ID is not the brand ID. It is not anyone's. It's a complete independent 
ID which identifies that real estate asset. And it's and it's extensible as well, where yes, you have a core ID for the for the property, but if you want to extend that down to room category, room type, individual unit, knock yourself out. And you can suddenly start defining those individual highly granular units independently or separately or however you'd like to do it, which is fine. But just imagine this case where the controller of whoever that may be, and yes, the brands may state, hey, if you're going to become a brand, you have to relinquish control over this ID to us. And maybe that's something an owner wants to do it's or like doesn't a want to. Code. I mean, it's is, a total hotel as long as you're in the brand. But it's a, unique one that, it's a unique one that endures, but then you can say, oh, Officially, my availability rates and inventory are pointed right here. We're using this particular API. Here's the URI where you can access it. Here's the documentation for it. And you can decide who has access to see that or not. Right? That's as simple as it is. It's, it's a registry. But if you have that registry, all of a sudden there's a whole layer of innovation which can occur saying, Oh, well, that's very, very interesting. Now that we know who you are and how we want to sustain them, maybe you want to, we want to have continuity of, of business analytics. Maybe you want to have continuity of distribution. Maybe we want to have continuity of ERP systems. And there seems to be a large number of folks, including some major hotel groups who may we may have been talking about, who um, don't necessarily see a problem with that. And maybe, I mean, having a permanent address is a great idea. I mean, in all it's honesty, a, it's, the, it's the solution to the hospitality industry if they are serious about, quote, booking direct, and direct should be to the owner because they're the ones who pay for everything. Then the destroyed every franchise model in existence, though. Not necessarily. No. Mm. It, it's what it, it winds up separating out. If those franchise models are producing for those owners and they are, you know, authenticated, we're t looking at um, an attribution, right? If they are responsible for generating that revenue, absolutely, they should be for it. The groups who would probably be highly against it would be the ones who are kind of fraudulently claiming attribution for um, traffic that they don't really have anything to do with. And those oh, guys before, should should go away, right? Before I forget, I, I thank know. you for wearing your hospitality pin today. Yep, secret society pin. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I don't know oh, all the handshakes. Wait, uh, it's secret handshakes. We change it every month. So when we wait, catch wait, up next time, I, I'll, I'll can I show my tramp stamp of it? It's right <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> Sit down, Robert. <laughs> So I would love uh, to circle back, actually. This is sort of like a follow-up to Holly's question um, to Katya about what sort of topics people are asking about. But I actually had just sent this out to a couple of you this week. And in the, the research that we're doing, I find that oftentimes we like to tell our clients what their problems are. Um, but I'm curious what you're hearing from people that their problems are specifically in, um, from your perspective, how sales, marketing, and revenue management work together, or perhaps they don't. Um, so what sort of things are you hearing over and over again about the challenges that they have as it, really, it relates to achieving revenue gains, increased profitability? profitability, collaboration between the departments? What sort of feedback are you getting from your hoteliers? And for those who are watching that are hoteliers, I'd encourage you to uh, drop your comments into the chat as well. Um, great question. Actually, you pretty much hit on it. I would say the most frequent thing that we hear would be um, not cohesively working together, that they operate in silos. Um, so when uh, the rev management team are setting rates or so on. It's not with a conversation of what's to be expected, potential group business coming in, um, and so on. So that that would be number one. Is just that the teams aren't cohesively working together. Um, the other one that I would say we get challenges on is because our our member base varies from the the mom and pop level where they own one hotel and operate it themselves. They function as every single title under that. Um, hotel, uh, whereas we have the more sophisticated management companies 
with multiple properties um, that actually have a dedicated uh, rev management team. Um, so their conversations are a little bit different. But for the folks that are doing it themselves, they, they don't understand the break even point. They don't understand um, what reporting to actually look at um, and then how to use those reports, the frequency of looking at the reporting um, to apply it to their day-to-day -day decision making or weekly, quarterly, et cetera, and um, forecasting. So um, a lot of it boils down to communication and then needing additional training. And uh, what we found is you can provide information, but without the opportunity to apply it, it doesn't always stick. Um, so if we do in-person training, we try to have some type of application exercise um, or something a little bit more interactive um, so they can actually use the tools that are being presented to them in the training. So the adoption of the information um, and how it applies to what they're doing on a day-to-day -day is a struggle. And this is, of course, not all hoteliers, just uh, the ones that operate um, under most functions under the hotel. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. And for those who are saying that the the departments don't collaborate, I know you work with a lot of hotel owners or general managers. Do they feel that it's not within their power to make that happen, or are they, are they trying to do things to get those departments to collaborate, and their initiatives aren't working? Like, given that they're supposedly in the position of power over how these departments operate. Um, what do they see as their role in helping them to collaborate and what do they see as some of the challenges in getting them to collaborate? I will say there's probably a mix of those that are possibly not aggressive enough uh, and putting their foot down and setting uh, the standard in which things have to go. You have to report um, X amount of times a day. We have to have daily touch point meetings, things like that. Um, to those that uh, perhaps due to how understaffed some hotels are with the staffing challenges that they're um, experiencing right now, just don't have the manpower to really dig into the details and get everybody uh, bought in and involved with it all. Um, that, that seems to be a, a con or another one I hear a lot of is buy-in across mm -hmm. departments of what needs to be done uh, and then actually allocating the time and energy to take all the appropriate steps. Okay. Just yeah. so you know, uh, Darian from Barcelona direct messaged me on LinkedIn, which I thank you, Darian, which I don't, because we're friends, I guess. Uh, awareness of what the other one's doing. <laughs> thank you, Darian. <laughs> yeah, no, have the, the right hand, the left is doing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I think you make a, a great point on it because doing this stuff right also takes commitment. A lot of, right. I, I, so, you know, a, a challenge for a lot of hotels was yes, let's go do this and starting the process or the, you know, the program is not the end. That's just, oh, now we've got to keep up with it. Now we've got to monitor this and, and track it and, and keep it going, which is a, which is a challenge, right? I'm sure you've read the Ebbinghaus curve, the forgetting curve. Oh, I'm so sorry. The Ebbinghaus. No, I don't. The Ebbinghaus rule, uh, the forgetting curve. What you learn. No. Holly is... reads. The rest of us don't read. We're, no. we're functionally illiterate. So no, I think Holly I, I don't really watch it much. I was, doing, I was doing a presentation a couple of weeks ago, and I said, "Oh, guys, have you read?" And I'm guessing, have any of you here read the Mythical Man Month? And I was like, "Well, it was written." We read in 19... a lot of comics. It was written in 1975. Part of Marvel universe? No? Oh. It was written in 1975 by a software engineer. I can't believe you haven't read it. But it's fascinating. Uh, it's all about how if you have a man, uh, if you have a job that takes one man 10 hours to do. Oh, you mentioned this before. Yeah, I like yeah, this. Go ahead, please. I'm sorry. I did okay. it doodly on it. Um, if you, so you have one guy that takes 10 hours to do it. If you hire two, will it then take five hours because you have two? And if you hire three, will it take even less? No. I think the number is if you hire four, it'll actually take 11 hours. Like there's a, because of the communication issues, the time actually increases. But to that point was the reading thing. When we were talking about the uh, convergence of the departments, I was, that's the presentation I was doing it in. And the Ebbinghaus curve, it's called the forgetting curve. It's a, 
the thing in training that's maddening. Whatever you learn today, 80% of it, I think it's closer to 87% of it is gone tomorrow. And mm -hmm. within, a, you know, it's, I think it's like 60% is gone by tomorrow, but within 30 days, literally 87% of it is gone. So all this money that we invest in training, mm -hmm. it, if there's not the reinforcement, if you don't realign goals, it's wasted. It's entertainment. It's not mm -hmm. changing any behaviors. And it's maddening as a trainer because it's I can tell you as a, somebody who sells training to hotels, it's a piece of cake to sell them training, it's so hard to sell them an ongoing change mm -hmm. program because it's such a larger time and money investment. It's maddening. Mm -hmm. and we, we see that with technology as well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, in a few of the panels that we've posted over the past few years, it comes up that um, money is spent on this technology that is not adopted and it ends up creating the need for more tools to learn the product um, that you eventually end up needing new technology by the time you get it all together. Oh. But user adoption is always an issue. Um, Huge. Yeah. I, I, well, I wait a second, Lily. Point. Lily, when you install a new revenue management system, you have the default parameters. That's not enough. <laughs> that, that doesn't, doesn't, oh, how odd. So, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's it's all of the systems, and I think, you know, even, it's really interesting because even some of the, I'm just going to say a major PMS vendor, um, when they send somebody to train you on the installation, we often will be hired to project manage it because we're there teaching the trainer all these little things that you can do in the system that they didn't know about that are actually beneficial to the hotel. So I do think that, you know, I, I feel for all of these hoteliers because we can sit here all day and tell them all the things that they should be doing, but at the end of the day, they have limited budgets and limited time and they have to decide what's going to be most important. But I think that when you're making a major investment like a new technology system in particular, Number one, you're looking at the likelihood of having to make that investment again very quickly if you don't make the right decision or losing a bunch of efficacy where over time you can't even calculate the labor cost of the fact that you aren't using the system properly. Um, number two, when you're talking sales and marketing or revenue, all these are revenue generating departments. This is where you have to start, in my opinion, to do things right to really take the time to do the learning, to invest in the program that Holly is talking about. We have similar programs on the revenue management side that are ongoing. Okay, let's keep this moving. Let's make sure that we're applying this. Let What has changed? How can we adjust the KPIs? How can we write a marketing plan or a budget that's not just based on I have to get this deadline in, but actually means something to you and that you plan to follow and is a good strategic plan for the hotel. Because if you start with the biggest investments doing those right and the revenue generating departments, theoretically, everything else should start to flow to the bottom in a way where you can start to make investments like let's put tablets in the room so that we can get better data from that or do an additional guest service training so that we can get better data from that. But first you need the revenue coming in the door. And so it's a good place to start the investment. I get to do my shameless plug. Next week I'm going to Orlando and Boca. And Kat, you've already seen this before, but the Rocket Program, the Revenue Optimization, Convergence, Education, and Training. And my partner in time, Bonnie Buckheiser, um, has two statements she makes. One is called Chinese Food Training which she says, um, you get this fire hose of data and you're, you're filled up and it leaks out your ears because it's all this stuff to remember. And then you walk out the door, you feel very full, only to be a very short period of time later, empty because you can't retain hardly any of it uh, because it's, it's too much, too fast, too, uh, less, uh, not, not enough time for assimilation, which is a point I want to bring back to you, Holly, on something that you pointed out to me. And the second was, is that uh, when it comes to uh, what she calls Xerox training, you buy a new system, you train the team on the system, and then people normally leave and new people are brought in. But the people that are using the system only use about 40% of it, let's say. 
they're not using the full functionalities. They're using what they remember from the training that they got on the system, which is about 40%. And so that 40% gets transferred to the next person. Well, they only remember 40% of the 40%. Next thing you know, you get a carbon copy of a carbon copy of a carbon copy. You got somebody that is using less than 10% of the system's capabilities. And now there's a huge financial system. Oh, our system's terrible. It doesn't do this. It doesn't do that. And oftentimes, one of the best solutions is to retrain the system again to realize that there's updates that maybe you didn't buy or should get or that you didn't know about there's functionalities that are in there that have long since been forgotten that just need to be trained into your usabilities again or dormant things that it did do that never were used that could be used now sometimes just why don't you put a little wash and wax on the card before you buy a new car and and see if it, it still can do what you need to do now sometimes it's just an old car and you got to get a new one but most of the times it's about training Going back to an earlier thing, Holly, that you pointed out, because um, one of the things, and you talk about crash and burn failures that I had, so um, I'm, I have no problems in sharing this about HSMI's APAC. We had this uh, uh, conference that was going to go in Singapore, and we did this advertising, and I did the advertising for them. And according to the numbers, they should have had 600 people attend. I mean, massive traffic engagement, massive click-throughs to the site. Problem was, they only had 150 people show up. And what we found out from post interview was a lot of the companies did not finance people to go to conferences or for training that year because they were so fat and happy that they just relied upon the third party vendors to teach them what they wanted to know. A whole mess of problems with that. Biasness, service scale, learning only the tools that are being given in the service profile. Lots of problems with that. But the reality of it is to what Robert says, Financial decisions have to be made, or excuse me, Lily, you know, financial decisions have to be made, prioritizations have to be made, and this was an easy one to make of, hey, why, why spend the money? We can get what we need from what the platform we're using from the people that are willing to, quote, give it to us anyway. But Holly made a point that when we do these conferences and we shove all this cool stuff at them, and they were like, oh, this is great. I got a thousand things I want to do. And then the next day they're going, oh, which is the first one? And she breaks hers out. You stretch it so that it's digestible, you know? And you, I think you made a really good point with that, how you've broken down your, your programs is, you know, here's this, and now you have something to walk away with and do. So I'll leave it to you to talk a little bit about that. But I think well, it's a brilliant way of taking it on. What's interesting though is, so I worked for Signature prior to launching my own company, and we do, Signature does a lot of mystery shopping, which is a great way to reinforce training. You know, you train somebody and then you evaluate whether or not they're using the skills. It's absolutely the best way. The problem today, I just did a survey around training uh, with all of my customers and specifically the mystery shopping is we're mystery shopping in the sales world on interactions that don't take place anymore. So we're mystery shopping on phone conversations with customers and the joke is Every time my phone rings, I know it's a shop because customers don't call me anymore. <laughs> like they come to me online or they send me an email or they, you know, fill this out. And so it's just such a disconnect that it's maddening and we haven't kept up. So we need to, we need to, you know, really shift. One of the uh, things that I'm working on right now is, and Lily, actually, you brought this up a while ago. Uh, if you can align the goals, uh, right. of your revenue management team and your sales team and your e-commerce team, you're going to get a lot more communication. And one of the things that you said, Lily, was forecasting. I mean, that's what revenue managers are, they're um, uh, measured very much on how accurate their forecasts are. From a sale, group sales standpoint, what's a big indicator if a sale is going to happen? Any guesses? Uh, deposit? Yeah, like that signed would be a good guess. Signed contract? Yeah, signed, yeah. Theoretically. The, Not the, the order. Um, <laughs> the <laughs> number of emails mm. from the customer to uh, yeah. the salesperson should jump uh, within the seven days. That's a good indicator that the sale is going to close. Yeah. If mm. it's flat, if it's not, but who's looking at that? Who's looking if it's at the emails, emails from the salesperson to the yeah to the yeah. prospect, that's not a good measure. That's not the good measure. That's not <laughs> no. the act. I mean, you know, you should be emailing, but yeah, it's really how much they're responding. And it's also like an the penetration. Sure. Precisely, precisely. Mm -hmm. 
and yeah. also uh, throughout the organization, how many emails you're, how many different people are you emailing with? If you're just emailing with one, that's probably less likely that the sale is going to close. If you have a couple, mm -hmm. it's more. So it's you know measurement, but are we measuring the right things? Mm, yeah, and I think too, like you can make data say whatever you want it to. So I think also doing a gut check and saying, am I approaching this data in an unbiased way? Am I looking at the right data? One of the first things that we do with our clients from a revenue management perspective is look at their star report because they're like, well, our star is terrible or our star is really good or whatever. And we look at who they're using as competitors, and I'm like, well, you're padding your results, or you're, this is an aspirational set, let's be realistic. And they're like, well, I can't change it because of ownership. That's fine. Run a second one. Because right. if you're making right. decisions based on your occupancy and ADR index mix on this set, your guests are not choosing between you and this set of hotels. So mm -hmm. you're making adjustments to a set of hotels and customers that's not even looking at you. You're going to have weird, disjointed results from what strategies you're setting. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and to answer one of your earlier questions, uh, Kat, about how marketing and revenue management can work together, oftentimes when I walk into a client and to, to Lily's point, I can take marketing information as to who you're competing with in market and validate the argument that Lily just made, saying, look, this was built so your ownership felt good about themselves, that you're looking at your investors going, look, we're crushing our set. Yeah, your set's, you know, not even you. You're not even the right tier categories for what you're talking about. This is to make you look like, look at how much we have in voice. And and so if in any place, it should always have two sets. Uh, there should always be an aspirational set. You should always see if I were to tier up or tier down, how would we roll either way with it? That should be a, a kind of a given. But um, that, well, I can go into a market and show you who online you're competing with in your market for it and say, look, who you think in your star report is not matching. These are the people that are taking business from you online. They're mm -hmm. looking for what your hotel is valued at, but going to these hotels and you're not comparing yourself to these people. You need to put this into your rev strategy for it and then accordingly make the adjustments. So that's one small little <laughs> crossover on, on how marketing and rev can work together. And all so of this really, really I would be curious to, to hear, oh, have you had people say, uh, oh, no, no, <laughs> Sorry, have you had, a, uh, had anybody say, I didn't know I could have more than one comp set? Occasionally, okay, um, we don't hear it quite as often, more so it's, you know, well, that's not an expense we're approved for, which, by the way, is about $600 a year, I think, when I last checked, so not very expensive at all. Um, but I think that the other thing is people are like, well, there's, there's no point because my owners won't care about it. Like, yes, but theoretically, if you're making decisions on the right data, even if you have to be measured on this first set of inaccurate competitors, your results will still improve. I don't know what this comp set's going to do because they are working with a totally different target audience, but as long as you're improving your occupancy and you're improving your ADR, that should make you look better against any set, but you're never going to be able to do that if you set strategies based on hotels that you're not truly in competition with. So that's what we try to come back to them with. But it is oftentimes, you know, a, kind of a more of a what's the point conversation than a lack of knowledge because they feel that it's not worth it if their ownership isn't going to look at that set and they kind of overlook the fact that it's going to have an impact on the overall view. Yeah, and the importance of strategy. Um, I, right? I brought that up from, um, we, oh, you can go ahead, Robert. No, go ahead. <laughs> Keep competing. Go, 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 go. <laughs> I was just gonna say, uh, with um, STR, they offer a certification hotel industry analytics program, the CHIA. Mm -hmm. Um, AHOA offers that to our members at a very steeply discounted rate. But um, in that class, each time, it's amazing to hear how many people are like, oh, I didn't know I could do that. And these are the owners. So right. um, uh, yeah. that's why I'm curious. <laughs> you heard it yeah, I, I will say that it may be owners more often who aren't aware of it. To be fair, our subset of clients, we do deal with a lot more management companies than ownership direct. And when we do deal with ownership direct, it's usually the major REITs. Um, but it's the 
I think it is the individual owners that are more likely. I, re I recall when I used to work for corporate Best Western in their revenue management department, then those, those questions did come up much more often because you're typically working with operators who maybe have limited experience in the hotel industry that are getting into it maybe for the first time or maybe they've only had a few and they haven't benefited maybe from the different training programs that are available as of yet. So I think that that may come up a little bit more in subsets like that. Unfortunately, we struggle to uh, bring some of those clients on due to our pricing. Um, but I think it's it's one of those things where the investment's totally worth it. And I'm really glad that that Chia is available to them. I've taken it myself. Um, and it's really, even I learned a few things that I didn't know, particularly in that last section about some of the reporting that's available from an ownership perspective. Mm -hmm. I think that's really valuable. So I think that that's a great thing for every hotel owner and operator to take. Every hotel owner should be certified in Chia. When the data conference in Nashville first started up, they had that, uh, they, they did their academy. Yeah. And this goes back, I don't know, 10 to 12 years ago. And I, and, and I was speaking at the conference that one that year and they said, well, you know, you're speaking, to them, you can join us for free to the, to the academy. I'm like, oh, good. You know, well, oh, uh, you know, I, I pretty much know everything there is about Smith Travel Reporting. Yeah. First five minutes in, Chris blew me away. I'm like, I know nothing about Smith Travel Reporting. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is an amazing program, and it really is some good data for. It. But some other things going back to the marketing and revenue management crossover is, you know, um, marketing. We monitor Air DNA for Airbnb. Not all markets need this kind of monitoring, but we monitor that. We look at what what goes in because that's your elasticity of demand, you know. And then a lot of times, revenue managers get dumbfounded that they're pushing what they think is compression in the market when, in fact, all of a sudden there's this huge leak in the balloon because all this inventory comes into market from Air, uh, Airbnb. And it, it dilutes your ability to leverage your rate strategies. And, and they don't look at those things, but there's a way to kill that impact on market knowing when there's lead times. And things like AirDNA, where you can look at data and so forth. And from a marketing presence, when we can see traffic build on those things, we can come to revenue management and say, look, guys, we're in Airbnb's lead time window right now. And right now, because of the other factors of uh, restriction reductions and so forth, they're getting market share. Uh, that we can see. So what do you want to do about that? And then revenue management now has as a tool to function as to what they want to battle that with if there's a need to do that in market for some things. But that's that, again, sharing the data that you're talking about with the proper resource for them to make an action on is that kind of stuff. And then they can go back and say, okay, well, this is what we want to do. And now we know where they're driving their traffic from, the demographics, the geographies, whatever. We can go fetch as marketers and say, great, we know that there seems to be a, a demand cycle from these feeder markets at this rate level for these time windows, and this is what revenue management has given us as, as a spear to, to use against that at this lead time. And that's when the collaborations really start making magic, because then when you finally kill that lead window for Airbnb, they don't come back within the three, seven, five day window stuff as much as other competitors in market. They come back on high lead times. So you, if you can stifle some of that demand pressure at the time that it's most critical, by collaborating that kind of data, you you effectively turn into a very cohesive team at that point. You know, you work together, not making sure the data gets shared. So that's just another crossover point. So did you? Hey, Lauren, did you? T I sent you and Lily a job description from a company, an e-commerce mm -hmm. job description that I felt like was really interesting in terms of they. I felt like they married the e-commerce and revenue management role into one. Into yeah, they the did e find a lot of stuff. Actually, I thought they leaned really heavy on the marketing side, and you would ask questions about what was missing from the revenue side. And I thought there was a really um, uh, gap point on data crossover. I don't think they really they, – they leaned on functioning marketing programs, but not on functional data interpretation as much. The job was for e-commerce. I mean, that was the yeah. role. Yeah, but the data – they were just talking about – they, they were talking about running stuff, but they weren't really talking about – the analytics of it. They were like the the, the the implementation, but not the interpretation. I thought it was weak. I oh. thought they were just soft on the interpretation side. I, I was surprised that it was so uh, convergent. Yeah. Oh, it's I feel like the they kind of didn't leave anything out on the revenue management side that's key, other than if you want to get really tactical day-to-day -day reporting and things like that. Um, but I would say that 
most e-commerce descriptions that I've seen do go a little bit more heavily on the marketing side because it's it's supposed to be the online presence of the right. hotel, specifically on online channels, not necessarily running the weekly revenue strategy meeting or you know some That's different things that they included in there. Now, theoretically, could that person do all of the above? Um, sure, effectively with an analyst, because that's a lot to cover. Um, but I think it just shows where, you know, I've talked about this a little bit in the past, where revenue management is going, is that maybe we're not going to have separate revenue and marketing departments and sales departments. Maybe we're going to have a chief strategist and a chief analyst and they're going to oversee all three areas. You may have separate sales managers. You may have a creative on the marketing side who's actually building out your design work, but that's not the same thing as marketing analytics. And typically, very design-focused people aren't great with analytics and vice versa. Try and get an analytical person to design a brochure and awesome. you'll get a very interesting and probably uh, basic <laughs> result. Um, so I think that it's really that we we get so stuck as an industry on specific titles. And one of the things that we've done to try and break the mold, even just internally in our little company where we're focused on revenue management, is we do strengths based hiring. And I have made up all sorts of job titles within my company based on people's individual strengths. So if they're really great with systems and training, now they're the brand systems manager. If they're really great with marketing and working with partner companies, now I've got a um, senior communications director and communication could be anything, you know. So we, we try to make the title something that helps people understand what it is that this person does as much as we can because that's really what a title is supposed to be is a, a basic understanding of what that person does. But we do all sorts of things like PI assessment, strengths finder, and just measuring their performance over time and where they excel. And we will create jobs around people's strengths. And I think that that has, has made us much stronger as a company because we're able to really leverage people's strengths rather than trying to pigeonhole them like, well, you know, you're not that great at analytics, so now you can't be a revenue manager, but all your strengths are in ideation and futuristic thinking. Why aren't we leveraging that? Because that is a talent that we need within the company. But to echo what um, Lily was saying in terms of the organization and the convergence, the key is really to have the, the unified strategy because then you can tactically implement it a variety right. of, of different ways. And we were talking about, you know, if you do a, a new system implementation or your brand cutover, the key is having that, that core strategy because, you know, just having, okay, we had the room categorization set up, you know, in this form because it was in the previous system. Well, maybe that's the only way that system, maybe it's an older technology, that's the only way it could get stuffed in there, right. you may have a lot of different capabilities to set up a different way, which is a lot more, it's very easy to just go, oh yeah, let's just copy the stuff and everything's the same. But to make that change, you know, to map the data and things like that gets very, very complicated. But that may be what you need to do to move forward. And then you say, oh, and now we can start measuring these KPIs, which are, which are really going to, you know, measure the incentives and the benefits of, of how we're going to going to develop our business. Um, yeah, you've got to have that unified strategy or you're just going to be, you know, kind of doing the same old, same old and maybe not moving forward. And that director of strategy person should be working outside of the traditional office at least a third of their time. Yeah. Because that's where you get your best ideas. You don't get it when you're sitting in a cubicle or the same office where you sit to have, you know, very standard kind of meetings. You've got to change up your environment. You've got to go, you know, visit different places, really get your head into a different space and start coming up with those creative strategic ideas. So you have the analyst person doing the reporting, right? You have them doing the number crunching, the data entry, and providing you with the information so that you can make the right strategic decisions. And I think sometimes we try to put so many things on one person that they can't 
break out of the day-to-day -day mold. I always work eight to five. I always work from this office. I always do this first and this first and this first. When you don't put yourself in an environment where that's shook up once in a while, you're going to limit your creative thinking capabilities. Right. Right, they need to interact with the director of catering, with the right. director of food and beverage, with the director of sales, the director of marketing, with the e-commerce, the revenue, all those different aspects. So you can pull it because the bottom line for the hotel is how are you maximizing the, you know, GOP or NOP? And, right. and those are all factors that are, are taken into consideration. And if you can do that, all of a sudden you can start streamlining the, oh, yeah, it looks like the catering director who's really fighting to meet their bonus, who's trying to take down the meeting space to go do whatever and fill it with weddings or social events or whatever at the end of the year, who's now fighting in competition with the sales director, who's trying to book these guest rooms to get that needs that meeting space to get them. And oh yeah, we've got the F&B guy who wants to do the big gingerbread house and a bunch of, you know, who knows what, you know, an extension of the restaurant to meet their goals. And instead of having those fights, you can go, yeah, this this is how things need to lay out and and hopefully get their goals set up so so those sorts of, of conflicts never never occur. Well, I hate to say this, but it's been two hours and yeah. 10 minutes that we've um, not even hit a news topic or anything. We just basically decided to uh, uh, have an enjoyable conversation. Yeah. yeah, and- uh, A slow news week you know, anyway, right? So. I, wish, I wish we had some good things to talk about. I have no idea. You know, dragging this out of you guys for two hours has been painful. No. <laughs> uh, it has been a pure joy. And obviously, there's even more topics that we need to bring this back to. I mean, this convergence obviously is, is a forever topic that we need to keep yeah. making sure we keep front in line and all of this on. And, and, and Kat, I can't begin to thank you enough for, for jumping on and, and actually doing some of the extra stuff. We did the, the LinkedIn Live precursor, which I, I had done by myself cool. the, only, the first time for the week before. It was fun to be able to do it with somebody this week. Uh, having you as a guest host, I'm going to be doing a podcast recap after this. Uh, and then I got to do the uh, Instagram TV, which I can only right now because of the followership that I, I, I didn't put on my personal one because there is a Lauren Gray that Robert will point out to you is uh, very popular on Instagram. She has 3 million people or something on it. Not uh, just a I think she's yeah, like a female bodybuilder. Indistinguishable yeah, no, I, from Lauren. I, I yeah, you can't tell the from the We're like twins. Competition there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So I, I, I have a hospitality digital marketing uh, Instagram page, but of course it only has, I don't even know how many, uh, it's 70 or 80 people on it right now. So I, I can only run 10 minutes on IGTV. So we'll do the first 10 minute drop on it. Um, but I'm going to do a, uh, the podcast uh, recap, which will be only 20 minutes of what we talked about today. Uh, so we have that and then we have the LinkedIn. So. With all of those things, uh, would we please come back. We, I definitely, as you know, from our first conversational po uh, that topic that we had, the human trafficking is is something I think we need to be resonant about, or, or resonate over and over with on, on whenever we get the chance. So we'd love to have you back for that. Uh, the fact that it's uh, Black Friday and that you all joined, I can't begin to thank you enough for. Uh, I've had, had our moments where holidays, uh, when the show comes up, it's usually me talking to myself, self I says. So um, it's good that I had uh, company this time around. Thank you very much for picking the date. Like that. Um, any closing comments from anyone about any of the things, please? And then we, I'd love to do a round robin as to what all of us do and where we do it at so that, we, that people can understand if they want to reach out more. So any other closing comments of the things we talked about? For anyone who happens to see the news so items, the which I don't know. Thing I wanted oh, go ahead. I think Robert's going to start. <laughs> That's always a good assumption. It's always a good assumption. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a safe bet. <laughs> um, it's like, go, go ahead, Robert. <laughs> no, 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 no. Please. The guest always gets priority. He has <laughs> never been like this before. I love speaking. You are a good He's influence yes. on Robert. That's it. Our, we overthrew the ratio, so I think no, no, Kat, it's helpful. Kat, Kat, Kat is much nicer <laughs> I than the other to... people. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Kat. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I wanted to mention, uh, just as a, a closing remark, I should have said it with the human trafficking stuff, but um, I had jotted down the Human Trafficking Polaris Hotline, which is 1-888-373-7888. Um, so once again, 
373-7888. Um, and I, I should have posted that or asked Lauren to post it in I the, did. It's uh, yeah, it's in the chat line. Posted yeah, it. chat line. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. And I mean, that's a uh, all access 24 seven number. If you have any suspicions, call that number. Fantastic. And you can also text help or info to two three three seven three three. Ooh, I don't know about that For one. For those so of us who hate, no, it's in there. Is I'm reading there? it right off your chat. Oh, right off of my other posting. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I don't yeah. have it memorized yet. Um, For those of us, if you can't make a phone call, for example, if you suspect that something's happening but that person is right in front of you or something along those lines, you can't be audible or you're just a millennial and so you hate picking up the phone, you yeah. can text help or info to 233-733. Well, look what happened in the news just recently, though, the girl that ordered pizza. Right. Did right. you see that? I thought that was brilliant. I didn't realize yeah. that that was a, a thing for it and that the uh, 911 person finally caught on that this is what she was trying to attempt to communicate, that there was an issue she couldn't be open about and that that was his, her way of reaching out, making the call. So yeah. there is a method, there is a method, but anyways. Um, Lily, since, you, since you're playing Tim Peter, but you're not Tim Peter, uh, for people who know more about you and what it is that you do, where is it they can find you? TimPeter.com. <laughs> Um, <laughs> see Peter on social media. <laughs> uh, so my name is Lily Mockman. I'm the CEO of Total Customized Revenue Management, better known as TCRM, and also the partner at ThinkUp Enterprises. And you can find me at tcrmservices.com or thinkupenterprises.com soon. That uh, website will be launching in a couple weeks now. Um, and we do all things revenue management, both day-to-day -day revenue for hire, as well as on the ThinkUp side, we do a variety of consulting services. Awesome. Ms. Holly Zoba. Holly at influencer-sales.com. I do all things really digital sales, sort of the marrying of digital with traditional selling. Mr. Robert Cole, sir. One caveat um, before, if Lauren, you are posting the list of new news items that we didn't get to, which if you do, um, I sometimes lace in items which I don't necessarily agree with, and I think they may be you know, full of crap. Um, there are two of them in there, so maybe which I should ones? highlight them. Um, the Expedia Group No Moat and Declining Margins from Seeking Alpha. You get a lot of people on Seeking Alpha who provide some uh, yeah, armchair um, quarterbacking in terms of the investment. Um, someone who does not understand the travel space, uh, you know, elaborating on their position on Expedia, which I think was, was highly yes. flawed. Was a um, position according to them, yes. Yeah, an another one, which I'm not saying you should buy or sell, but their their basis for the recommendations was quite, uh, quite far off. Um, so, yeah, sometimes, well, I don't know, sometimes you can maybe make a, a correct uh, recommendation without having the underlying, the right underlying assessment. Um, and the other one was the value add transparency key to making amenity fees work. Um, not good. It's a, resort fees are drip pricing, folks. It's not. I was surprised no to see you put benefit. that one there. Well, no, because yeah, it's full of crap and, and indefensible. Yeah. So, but besides yeah. that. <laughs> so. But anyway, you can find me at Robert K. Cole on social media or rockcheetah.com. And Kat, as our guest host, which you're more than welcome to come back at any time you would like and uh, displace the balance of power anytime you wish. Uh, <laughs> yes, I can do that. You have an open invitation. Join us at will and just let us know the opportunity. We'll always, in, 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 yeah, we'll, we'd love to have you back. And of course, we want to schedule a time back for you to continue the conversation as we go forward, especially with the driving. It'd be great, especially sometime maybe in January, given the month that it is. So uh, it'd be great to have you back uh, right after the holidays yep. kind of thing. Before I uh, depart from you all, um, I wanted to just make a little correction. So Kat is my nickname, which is actually short for Katija. Um, I, see, I, see, I see, I say it totally wrong. I'm, <laughs> all right, how many times do I say people's names wrong? I say them wrong all the time. Uh, um, you're in general. <laughs> or it's a general. I say Katya. I just like Kat. Katya. Okay. It's okay. The, the J is silent in many languages, so uh, it throws people off. Say but, uh, it right again. Say it right again. What is this supposed to be? Katija. I would have never guessed that. I would have never <laughs> guessed that. You're trying too hard, Lauren. Um, <laughs> I have said this. You've let me say this for how many years now? <laughs> well, you you always go back to cat, so I was like, eh, all right. Yeah. I thought it was cat. 
it works, right? Uh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, but okay. <laughs> I'm gonna, like, Robert, what was the last name I butchered? What was it? <laughs> Today? I it's was, wait, wait, wait. I, it's, it's I'm pretty good at Let's think back to one that you haven't butchered. Um, <laughs> no, I can't even feel it. Oh, wait, your <laughs> own name. Your <laughs> own name. You got at least half. Yeah, you got one. Yeah, this is Lorraine time. Gray. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I've butchered. Uh, oh, gosh. I don't They're know how many called names. Lorraine Yeah, they're Yeah, pretty much they are. But, yeah, I apologize for have ever always been – Literally for, I don't know, what has it been, two years? Well, I yeah, they've it's... known each other, but you usually just say cat. Uh, so, yeah, well. It's okay. It's more so for the viewers. Just <laughs> Please say her name right. Don't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure Lauren, to tune in and listen. Lauren <laughs> can only be taught through um, getting hit by lightning. And if yeah, you right. do that, then he will. And, and, and single syllable words. Do not go through syllable on me. I will, I will blow it every time. Yeah. So, Kat, <laughs> where is it they can find you and what do you do and all that good stuff? I'm going to stick with the one I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, so, I'm a director of education for AHOA, A H O A, um, but I do quite a bit of professional development training and other things um, outside of AHOA. Um, the easiest way to reach me, where your emails will not get lost in the mix of life uh, would be at cat, K -A -T, dot M dot speaks at gmail.com. Nice and easy. So I can triage all of you very easily to the top. Yeah, good. So now from an AHOA perspective, your big conference is coming up in April. It is. Oh, shameless plug time. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> April 13th to 17th in Orlando, uh, is the AHOA conference where actually we will have a CHIA certification program uh, available offering that uh, human trafficking awareness training there as well. Um, and we are working on uh, another certificate program on day one, but we are chock full of education, great trade show opportunities. If you're in the hospitality industry, it is definitely a great fun conference to attend. Um, there's a lot of networking opportunities uh, and we'll be in lovely Orlando um, I think we're close to Sea World and all the good stuff. So uh, there's more to do than just become educated and make connections. Perfect. Well, for this episode and all previous 224, you can go to, at least for now, because we're going to be changing it to his own home soon, hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com forward slash live. Look for show number 225. There you'll see Robert's link to his list, the replay of this show. In case you didn't see it in its entirety or segments you want to go back to with the time list as to dates, uh, times that we start talking about topics, uh, you'll be able to go into it for that. Um, as always, we will uh, now forward going having a podcast is a short recap of our content for those who don't have the uh, two hours and 21 minutes of conversation time to listen to. Um, but it gives you a chance to get to the highlights of what we talked about. And for those who did watch us on the variety of channels, all the Facebooks, the Twitters, the LinkedIn, the YouTubes, and so forth. Thank you very much for your in and outs on the uh, audiences. Um, and uh, to Darian for reaching out to me directly on LinkedIn. And uh, till next Friday, show number 226. Um, that's not our show that we're going to be having uh, another uh, our woman's show. What is, that's on the 13th. That's, that's the week after. I think, yeah. 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 Um, maybe next week we'll be on our new platform, which gives us 10 talking heads. And like I said, Kat, if you find time that you want to join us or jump in, but you all means you'll be welcome. We'll have plenty of extra little square spaces to go on uh, talking heads. And we'll, we'll just mute Robert and myself so you guys get a chance to talk and we'll just smile and wave. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but until next week, thank you all very much for participating. Hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. For those in countries that will see this be rebroadcasted, uh, we do a rebroadcasting in uh, the Asia Pacific region, 11.30 Sydney time, and in London, 11.30 uh, London time on Wednesdays. Uh, but happy Remembrance Day for all those countries that are participating in that for the uh, for this weekend. Uh, Australia, no in particular, Canada, uh, and so forth. So um, for that, thank you all very much for your time today, and uh, we will see you all next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you.